I don't see you smile, Anna. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank. No, that's fine. Excellent. All right. So thank you so much. So welcome to Pharmacology Two. We are going to continue with our sessions, and today we have a very interesting topic. We will talk about heart uh, hypertension. We are going to talk about angina. We are going to talk about heart failure. So please get rid of all the other secondary thoughts and focus because this is bread and butter in medicine. Okay, in your nursing career, you're going to see how many people are having hypertension, right? So how many people are going to have a angina or myocardial infarction? So this is the bread and butter. Okay, so please. All right, so let's get started. Uh, again, your participation is very welcome and is needed. So any questions, whatever you want to ask, let me know right away. Okay? All right. All right, welcome. So today we will talk about uh, drugs used for hypertension, angina, and uh, cardiac uh, failure. Okay? All right. So let's get started. So hypertension. All right, so hypertension, what is hypertension, right? Hypertension, listen to the word. That is your initially, uh, when you're going to talk about the uh, critical thinking. Uh, hyper high tension pressure. So I want you to imagine that you are the blood, you are the blood. So let's stand up and push the wall with your hands. Push, push the wall of the hands. Can you feel the pressure of the of your hands over the wall. Feel the pressure of, on your, from your hands on the wall. You are the blood and the wall is the artery. Okay? So that is actually the blood pressure. The blood pressure is the pressure of the blood against the arterial walls. And that is going to be measured with a, uh, with a pressure machine, right? So you already know that. All right. So that is hypertension. All right, so but there is a sense that is going to be part of your nursing uh, uh, or patient, patient education that is something that you can basically help the patient. So we, we already know what are the uh, normal blood pressure. We already know what is the pre-hypertension. We, we know what is stage one, stage two, and stage three. Right, uh, stage one and stage two. Sorry, there is no stage three. And actually, you're going to uh, uh, what you're going to do is you can help the patient with hypertension. I will tell you now. You can right now from the first few seconds you can start helping people. Now, if you have a patient with hypertension, and that is linked what I'm going to say now uh, with hypertension, and you are able, you are able only to decrease, decrease five millimeters of mercury of the systolic pressure, if you are able to do that, you're going to decrease the risk to have that patient a myocardial infarction in 30%. 30%. 30% of what where he was before. So if you have high blood pressure and actually with this patient education and health promotion you are able just to decrease five millimeters of the whole systolic pressure that is going to decrease the risk for myocardial infarction in about 30 percent all right so just from the first moment you can start saving lives okay all right so what are these life modifications that you need to uh, always uh, 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 educate the patient to stop or actually avoid, right? Number one is the smoking cessation, cessation, right? Cessation. Stop smoking. Stop smoking. Why? You know that the uh, smoking, they have seven different toxins. And these toxins basically what produce is a lot of free radicals, free radicals, free radicals, free radicals. These free radicals are going to make you older. By sure, right? They're going to make you older. The more free radicals you have, you are going to get older faster. Um, as it's going to affect all your body. But one of the things that is happening is that 
uh, the, that irritation of the free radicals on the endothelium of the vessel produce damage on the endothelium. When they, they have a damage of the endothelium, the endothelium start to regenerate, creating a, a, like a small bump there of a scar tissue that is regenerating, rege, regenerating. So when the blood flow is passing, they're coming cholesterol, cholesterol, and this cholesterol get trapped in these small bumps or scar tissue that is coming in the endothelium. And that is going to start accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. That is the beginning of the atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis. In addition to that, smoking, what is going to help you is this. So you need to remember from your anatomy physiology, and let's start, that the blood pressure is equal to the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. Everybody got that? You already passed my search, right? So uh, can you explain me peripheral resistance? What is this? Vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Exactly. So the vaso, the vaso constriction, what is going to cause? Increase or decrease peripheral resistance? Increase. Increase peripheral resistance. And when they increase, if you make the multiplication here, if this number go up, the blood pressure obviously need to go up. And that is what is happening when you're smoking. Why? Because smoking produces vasoconstriction. 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 You, you, from the moment you finish your, your, your cigarette, you have one hour of very much vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. So that is what is last. So a person who is a smoker, a uh, habitual smoker, is going to have always high blood pressure. Okay? So uh, avoid smoking. So avoid smoking. Why? Because they are going to decrease the risk to produce atherosclerosis and decrease the risk for increasing base, uh, peripheral resistance by vasoconstriction. Weight reduction is basically associated with the metabolic, metabolic disorder, metabolic syndrome and metabolic this weight reduction metabolic syndrome this metabolic syndrome is the mother and the father of the problems of the heart heart problems are going to be basically by metabolic syndrome you need to know what is metabolic syndrome metabolic syndrome is going to be those patients who has these uh, physical characteristics you have normal arms normal arms a normal chest, but what happened with your belly? Your belly is going to be like a pear shape, like an apple. Okay, so normal legs, normal legs, but the, this is belly are going to make you the indicator that most likely this patient has metabolic syndrome. A metabolic syndrome, these guys are going to take at least for 10, 10 uh, accumulative, 10 years, 10 years accumulative they are going to have high glucose in their diet or they have high cholesterol 10 years too in, the, in their diet, cholesterol. So all these are, can lead into glucose, for example, are going to lead into diabetes mellitus, metabolic syndrome. And here high uh, cholesterol, they can lead into uh, strokes, myocardial infarctions and strokes. So see, all these are going to be uh, associated with the metabolic syndrome. So weight reduction is important. So you already know by your nutrition, how to calculate the BMI and how to calculate the TDEE, the total daily energy expenditure formula. So you don't need to memorize the formula, but definitely you need to just uh, be aware how to get on that. So if you have a patient who want to lose weight because hypertension, that is a way. Okay? All right, so what is DASH diet? DASH diet is the dietary, what is, I don't remember that, to prevent hypertension, right? So DASH diet basically are going to be uh, increase your, uh, your uh, unsaturated fats. Increase your unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats. What are the unsaturated fats? Olive oil, uh, peanuts, nuts, all these oils are going to be unsaturated. Prevent what is saturated. You don't, you don't want to eat saturated animal fat. Physical activity. Physical activity is a very good why for many reasons. 
one of the of the reasons is especially who somebody have a, a problem with the heart you're going to have having physical activity is a process called angiogenesis 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 what is that angiogenesis is the formation of new vessels formation of new vessels especially at the level of the muscles, right? So when you're doing exercises, uh, your muscles are going to need more oxygen. So uh, if you have uh, a constant, uh, habitual uh, um, exercising every day, your muscles are going to start creating new vessels. I will tell you like baby vessels. So baby vessels are totally free of cholesterol. So that is going to basically decrease the the uh decrease the effort of the heart to push the blood if you have for example vasoconstriction vasoconstriction so the the same volume of blood they need to run and arrive to the same place but because the space is so narrow and you need to have actually the same other they need to receive the same amount of oxygen as before the blood the heart is going to be forced to push harder so we could we okay with that right Okay, uh, restriction of uh, alcohol intake. Uh, you know the alcohol. The, the alcohol they have seven kilocalories per per gram of alcohol. So you will see alcoholics that are obese. Yes, they are obese. Even they don't eat. Why? Because the alcohol is going to give this uh, this actually amount. And what they're going to do is going to increase weight. Stress reduction. Yes, stress reduction. Basically, you have, when you are stressed, you have uh, your cortisol is going up, your cortisol go up, your adrenaline go up, the adrenaline go up, and especially the um, uh, cortisol, what is doing one of the ten of, uh, table of 10 that you already know, is to retain sodium, retain sodium, retain sodium. And this retained sodium are going to pull water into the vascular space. And pulling water means you increasing the volume of the blood, means increasing the cardiac output, means you increasing the blood pressure, cortisol. Adrenaline. The adrenaline, what it's going to do, basically is going to affect the alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1 receptors, what they're doing is the vasoconstriction. Regular sleep pattern, at least seven hours per night, yes. So it's known that the sleep time is helping you to regenerate tissue, especially the nervous tissue. But it is statistically, we already know that those people who cannot sleep more than five hours in a, uh, in a, in a day, they have actually increased double the risk to have a heart attack in the next 10 years. Okay, so sleep patterns are very important. So you are sleeping less, you are living less. You're sleeping more, you increase your span life. Okay? Of course, they said, well, what I'm doing, I'm killing myself because I'm studying all day. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a time, right? It's a time then you can actually get into more time for yourself. Okay? So, but it's a time to be, but like, what? This is life, I guess. Sodium control, that is one of the main components of the, of the, of the uh, the first uh, first thing you're going to tell the patient, don't eat too much salt. To don't eat too much salt. How much is the uh, salt that you need to take every day as a daily requirement intake? How much? How much sodium salt? How much salt do you need to take every day? Maximum because you need sodium, sodium you know for muscles, etc. Nervous system you need sodium for a lot of stuff. Three hundred. Three hundred milligrams is the cholesterol. This is two grams. Two thousand. So oh. Two thousand milligrams. Okay, two thousand milligrams. So that is basically about like half a, a teaspoon of salt every day, no more than that. But this is not what you see. Because the meat itself, the meat, if you don't put salt, the meat, ha, the meat already has salt. The egg, they have sodium. So everything, all foods, they have some amount of sodium. 
So you need to be careful to, to not really go beyond of these 2,000 milligrams. And uh, for patients with hypertension or heart failure, you're going to use about 60% of us, so basically 1,000 milligrams, just to remember. Half of the salt, half of the salt. So you need to decrease the salt. How? But the food is not tasty. So what you're going to do? You're going to do salt substitutes. Salt substitute. Salt substitute. This salt substitute is going to be basically based on potassium. Potassium. Why potassium? If you see in the periodic table, remember the lithium, we have the beryllium, we have the sodium, we have the potassium, uh, we have calcium, I guess, beryllium, calcium, uh, it said lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, sesofrasium. Lithium, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, right? So this, if you see here, this is the first column of the periodic table. And this is going to be sodium and potassium are very close. And that means that they have similar properties, similar, not exactly the same, but similar properties. And they have the taste of the sodium, a little bit similar, but it's, but it's, it's be, that is better than Nancy. Okay, we get it with that? We got that? Yes. Okay, so in this first slide, I want you to imagine a patient, okay? I want you imagine a patient. So a patient who is a smoking, a smoking, a patient who is obese, a patient who is a couch potato, watching news or watching uh, uh, sports all day. All right. So just try to imagine that. Right. Uh, they have the beers always close to him or to her. Right. You have beer, smoking, couch potato don't do activity, eating trash uh, 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 food, pizza, uh, lays, uh, uh, potatoes, whatever, right? French fries, and very stressed out, very stressed out, stress, let's put it this way, uh, the bills is uh, actually drowning the patient with, with problems, right? And he's not sleeping, he's sleeping at two, three o'clock in the morning, wake up at four o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, and they like a lot of salty food. What salty food? Sausages, ham, whatever, bacon, all that. All those that are preserved for a long time, always, all of them, they have salt. Why, why they have a lot of salt? Because that salt preserves the organic material to stay as it is, and it's not going to decompose. So that's why the, they have a lot of preservatives, and one of the main preservatives our preservative are going to be the sodium. So now you can tell. So you have the idea of the patient who is basically uh, having these problems, and you need to educate the patient to uh, to what to uh, uh, to promote health. Okay. So those are everything that we was talking. Okay. So you need to discuss with the patient uh, the benefit of the medication. When you're talking about hypertension, hypertension is your, it's not like a, you're going to make a, um, you're going to take the pill like a Tylenol or ibuprofen. When you have pain, you you take the pill and you go okay. No, it's not like that. When you are being diagnosed for hypertension, number one, hypertension is for life. Once you are actually uh, diagnosed by with hypertension, that is for life. Second, you need to take the medication every single day, every single day, because if you stop the medication, that can produce a rebound effect. So it's going to have a, a hypertensive crisis. So and that can kill the patient. Too much pressure on the, on too much pushing the wall, <clears throat> too much pressure against the wall, they can bring rupture and basically a, a one more thing. If you have too much pressure, what happened with the cholesterol that is is on the wall. You have here the blood flow is coming this way, but the pressure is very high. So this cholesterol, there is a moment that is going to rupture, and that can lead into an embolus. This embolus can be going to the brain or can be to the lungs, and that can lead into a stroke or pulmonary embolism. Okay? 
All right. So we apply everything that we already know. So that's why I'm coming a little bit light on that. Is that okay or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. So now, uh, NCLEX question here. Uh, how you're going to make that diagnosis of hypertension? Okay. So first of all, when that is your clinicals, right? So you need to sit down the patient and the patient uh, uh, can cross legs or not? No. And why they, they cannot cross legs? Because it doesn't look good or because what? <laughs> why, you don't, why you don't cross the legs? Because it's not, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not nice or what? Why, why you don't cross the legs? Or you can cruise, cross le the legs. Hmm? What do you think? It's lack of respect or what? What do you think we, <laughs> why we think you shouldn't cross the legs? Like, does huh? it like interfere with the circulation? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That is going to make vari variable the, the blood pressure. You okay with that? That is why. All right. So it's for a reason. Second, when you're going to take the blood pressure, especially in the when the issue have outpatients that are coming, you need to be sure that the patient at least need to rest five minutes. Because what about is the patient, oh, I was late for my appointment, I start to run, or actually they are going to be uh, uh, in stress. So you need to just relax the patient, right? And that is the moment that you can take the blood pressure. Otherwise, it's going to be elevated, okay? Number three. So uh, when you have blood, uh, the blood pressure normally are going to increase for different reasons. The blood pressure can increase after you smoke. Yes or no? Yes. Why? Smoking can cause vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. Very good. All right. So up to one hour. So your blood pressure in the next hour is going to be basically higher. Second, you're going to uh, have high blood pressure or increase, no high blood pressure, increase your blood pressure is better when after the meals, after meals, after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, your blood pressure uh, normally is going to be a little bit higher than the base. Okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, that are basically the recommendation. Oh, if the patient is running, whatever, exercising, of course, you need to rest because they're going to increase the blood pressure. Okay. Now, so you have got, you have high blood pressure. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. <clears throat> you are hypertensive. You are being labeled as hypertensive forever. The answer is no. You cannot, if you have blood pressure right now, high, you need more than one reading in different times in order to make a diagnosis of hypertension. So you have, for example, outpatient, you have uh, outpatient, you have uh, blood, high blood pressure today, and the next visit, if they find out another high blood pressure, that means that you are basically hypertensive and you start to need to receive med uh, medication. So this discuss how medication will benefit the patient. That is really important because the patient is not, this is not like a candy or Tylenol or Motrin. When you have blood pressure, I just take my, my, my medication. No, you need to take it every day. Lifestyle changes are equally important as a drug therapy. That is NCLEX and HESI. Okay, so please. Patient motivation improves when the patient has positive experience with healthcare provider. So for example, you need to, uh, uh, encourage the patient to socialize, to more, more activity, uh, I don't know, uh, go to uh, some jogging or some uh, other activities that are going to be enjoyable by the patient. So that is what we need to do. So life mod lifestyle modifications and uh, motivation of the patient are going to produce the adherence of the treatment. The adherence of the the treatment is not only a pill, it's going to be lifestyle modifications. Those are very important. So if you don't do that, if you eat a lot of food, you rest, don't do exercises, you sleep very poorly, 
actually, we, but I'm taking my medication. You are not doing anything. They need to go together, but, uh, side by side, okay? Okay. All right. So talking about uh, here hypertension, one of the things that I'm going to just refresh you here is the kidney, okay? Kidney. The kidney, what it's doing is, remember the functions of the kidney? Everybody, functions of the kidney? Fresh what are the red. Fresh red, right? Fresh red. Fresh red. What is fresh red? Filtration, reabsorption, excretion, secretion, and hormones. Hormones are the red. Red is D, vitamin D, E, the erythropoietin, the erythropoietin, and R is the renin. That is what we need to remember for hypertension. Just to refresh you a little bit, I'm going to draw here a kidney. They are going to release the renin, the renin, the kidney. This is the kidney, the kidney, the renin. The renin go to the liver to produce the angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1. Then this angiotensin 1, they go to the lungs to produce angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2. This angiotensin 2 go to the adrenal gland, adrenal gland to produce aldosterone, aldosterone, and this aldosterone go to the kidney and reabsorb sodium, reabsorb sodium, sodium. This reabsorption of sodium are going to pull water inside the vascular space, increasing the cardiac output. Increasing the cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure. Nice? It's a review, right? Or you want me to go in detail? Hello? Please, please, please. Uh, I want participation because it's a long class and if you, we can make it faster and easier if you participate. Is that okay? So everybody... Yes. Yes. The RAS system? Okay. That is what is going to be base of all the class today. So you must know that. Okay? The RAS. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. No? Yeah. Okay. All right. So now... Uh, for example, you have the reabsorption of sodium. So, <clears throat> so what is doing the sodium? What is doing the sodium? Uh, I mean, how is uh, in the rats? What we are looking is the aldosterone, right? Aldosterone, aldosterone, aldosterone. What is going to do is to reabsorb sodium, sodium, and are going to exchange with potassium. All right. So, what does it mean? Normally, what you're doing is to absorb sodium, normally, without medication, without anything. So you take the uh, sodium is reabsorbed, it's followed by water, but the sodium in exchange, we are going to eliminate some potassium, some potassium. That is very important, okay? They are going to eliminate some potassium. Another regulator of basically aldosterone, what is going to regulate is the uh, cardiac output, the cardiac output, the cardiac output, aldosterone, volume. Sodium, water, volume, aldosterone, cardiac output. Another hormone that are going to um, uh, be uh, affecting the fluid balance and the cardiac output is the antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone, the ADH. So you have two hormones, A and A, aldosterone and ADH. Okay? But I would say most important in this case will be the aldosterone. Aldosterone. All right, so here we have. I will show you here. This is the glomerulus. This is glomerulus. This is the Bowman's capsule. This is the afferent with the artery cam with the blood coming this way. And this is the efferent. And here we have the proximal convoluted tubule. They are going to be the, the loop of Henry. And they are going to come back. Yes, all the distal convoluted tubule. Every single distal convoluted tubule are going to come back and go in between the afferent and the efferent. This is the area where you're going to produce the renin. That's it. I'm not going to ask you about the juxtaglomerular apparatus or the juxtaglomerular cells. I'm not going to go on that. So it just has to illustrate that where it's coming from the renin. So every, every nephron on the top, they are going to have uh, an apparatus that are going to be able to produce renin. When do you produce renin? When your blood pressure is low. When your blood pressure is low, when your blood pressure is low, you're going to trigger the RAS system. 
the renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, aldosterone, and the, uh, release the aldosterone to reabsorb water and increasing the blood pressure. Do you agree that? Yes. 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 Okay, so that is basically what we were mentioning. And here is another important component that you need to remember. Uh, talking about the heart, talking about the muscle contraction, remember the muscle contraction is going to be a, what we call the contractility. 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 What is contractility? You increase contractility, the force of contraction increase. Are increase. Okay, so just remember this. For example, this is, if you remember this, this is going to be the, re, uh, the uh, contraction, right? Contraction of the muscle. This is the relaxation of the muscle. So, we okay? You follow me or no? Please? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, what happened here is we are talking about contraction. Don't think about your biceps, your triceps. Think about the arteries and veins too. Arteries and veins. Arteries. Arteries, they are going to have a smooth muscle. Arteries have a smooth muscle, a smooth muscle, a smooth muscle, a smooth muscle. Arteries have a smooth muscle. And that is going to behave, as we already mentioned, that they are going to enter a lot of sodium, a lot of sodium, and then sodium get inside the cell. This is all what is inside here is inside the cell. And the sodium is going to increase, 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 because more sodium is coming in, 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 in. So that's why this curve of sodium is going up. But when they reach to the top, they are going to enter calcium. Calcium. So that produces the vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. So there is drugs that are going to basically block the, uh, block the channels of calcium. So if you have blocking or diminish the entry of calcium into the cell, there's going to be less contractility. And that is one of the ways that we treat hypertension. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So we have alpha-1, uh, beta-1 receptor. So uh, when we are talking about hypertension, we need to remember the alpha-1 and the beta-1. So one more thing here. Alpha-1 is the same to say alpha-1 agonist. Agonist is the same. So you can say just alpha-1 or just, you, you want to say alpha-1 agonist. You can say that. Or you can say beta-1 alone. You understand that beta-1 alone is like you saying beta-1 agonist. You okay with that? So, but when you are talking about antagonist or blocker, so those medications who are going to block are going to block this receptor, you must say blocker or antagonist. Antagonist or blocker. So I'm going to put it here. Blocker or antagonist is the same. So you will hear that in English and Hesse in different flavors and colors. So they are going to tell you blockers or antagonists. They are actually the same. All right? So is that clear or not? Yes. So now, for when we are talking about alpha-1, I should say alpha-1 agonists, right? The alpha-1 are going to be the vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. I'm going to mention here alpha-2. Alpha-2 produces the vasodilation. 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 Alpha-1, alpha-1 vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 vasodilation. Beta-1 are going to increase the heart rate the heart rate, and increase the contractility. Contractility. I told you what is contractility. Contractility is what is the strength of contraction of the muscle. So increasing the contractility, you're increasing the force of contraction. So instead of the heart to do this, are going to do this. Increase contractility. And who is doing that? The beta-1. And what is doing the beta 2? The beta, the beta 2 are going to be the bronchodilation. It's going to be the bronchodilation. Bronchodilation. Yeah, if you remember, if you don't, you tell me, do you want me to rephrase that or are we okay with this? 
Hello, 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 please. Okay. Hello. Are you okay? Excellent. All right. So everybody has the chance to talk. If you don't talk, if you are shy, well, you're going to become more shy when you have the exam. So it's better, I'm, I'm trying to make it open for everybody. So that is, if you don't know, be honest with yourself. Yeah, let me know. Okay? All right. I want to be sure that everybody got it. Okay. So here we have a, a mall review here again. We have the heart, we have all the chambers, the septums, and the, all what all the valves you can tell there. And here we have the, the right side, and this is the left side. Here we have the essay note, SA note. This essay note is the pacemaker. Essay note or sinusal note, sinusal note, or uh, call, there is no pacemaker here, okay, pacemaker, pacemaker. All right, so that is the one who keep the rhythm. This is going to depolarize between between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So that means that's electrical impulses. This is an autonomic. So they're going to be automatic, auto, automatic. So they are going to shoot. They're going to shoot electrical impulses. And the electrical impulses are going to travel like if you put water on the floor, right? Whatever is closer to you, is going to get wet and then far more uh, then and then when you get far the water so it's an order right so that is the same thing with the electrical impulse electrical impulse is coming what is going to hit first is going to hit the atriums then it's going to keep traveling and they are going to hit the ventricles so that's why you have first of all the contraction of the atriums and then the contraction of the ventricles of the ventricles okay all right so that is going to give you the lop dub. If you don't remember that, uh, I will say lop dub. Lop dub is the closure of the atri of the atrioventricular valves. What does it mean? The closure of the mitral and the and the uh, mitral and the tricuspid valve. So those are actually the one who are going to close first, and the second are going to be the uh, semilunar valves, the aortic valve and the uh, pulmonary artery valve or pulmonic valve, as we want to know. Okay? All right, so if you can tell here, and uh, what is the port of this, is this. When you have lop dub, lop dub, lop dub, lop dub, lop dub, lop dub, you are talking about muscle contraction. Yes or no? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. Now, what happens if you have like this? Blah, 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 blah. That's called arrhythmia. So when you have lobbed up, that means sodium, potassium, out, so sorry, sodium, calcium, and out, potassium, chloro, magnesium. Lop. Contraction. Lop, dub, lop, 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 lop. It's going to sodium, calcium. Dub, 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 dub. Relaxation is going to go out. Potassium, chloro, magnesium. Lop, lop, lop with L. Lop, lop, lop are going to enter sodium and calcium. Dup with D. Dup, dup, dup are going to exit potassium, chloro, magnesium. And if you have lop, dup, lop, 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 like this, like arrhythmia, what does it mean? You have a lot of entry of sodium and a lot of entry of calcium. That's correct. So what about if you decrease with the medication the window to enter the sodium or the, the window that enter the calcium? Either way. So if you block that, the heart is not going to produce the depolarization and produce the contraction of the muscle. So if you diminish the entry of sodium or calcium and or calcium, you're going to have, instead of have lap, 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 you're going to have lap, 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 lap. Love that, love that. Is that clear? Yes. So yes. we have, for example, you can tell me now calcium antagonism, all right? Or calcium channel blockers. That is what we are going to see today. Okay? All right. All right. So we have the hypertension, and this basically is just to tell you that the, the sympathetic nervous system, 
the sympathetic nervous system that is in the center, this is basically all sympathetic. What is cranial here or caudal here basically are going to be a, a parasympathetic. So, but at this moment, I just want to focus in the adrenaline. Adrenaline. When you have adrenaline, when you have a fight or flight, when you are in fight or flight, when you are upset, when you are angry, etc. Right? So your adrenaline is going up. Another thing that is going up is, for example, your blood pressure can go up for pain. Pain can go up uh, when you have pain. You can you, can, you have a high blood pressure or no? Increase your pressure? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Why? Why? Why, why, why? I'm trying to get more blood flowing to the area. Because of what? What is your state? Adrenaline. Um, that is called fight or flight, correct? Excellent. Yes. Tell me, when you're in pain, oh my God, I have, oh, very good, I have pain. I have pain, yeah, I have pain. No, you're not happy, right? You are actually under stress or not? Right? Yes. 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 Pain is going to make you look at this. You can you can tell when the patient is really in pain. When you have real in pain, the patient is very in fight or flight, and releasing a very sympathetic, uh, activating the sympathetic nervous system. And actually, what are the sympathetic nervous system doing with adrenaline? Your blood pressure go up. Pain. You in pain, you can have increase the heart rate. Yes or no? When you have pain, you have your pupils are dilated. Yes or no? Yeah. Right? Because all this is adrenergic response. All right? Okay. Cardinal signs of the heart. Remember the cardinal signs of inflammation? Yes. Okay. So the cardinal signs, this is a mass. So how many we have? There is a list here and there a little bit different, but I select these three, six of them, six of them. So the cardinal signs of inflammation are how many? Five. The cardinal signs of heart disease are going to be six. Heart, H-A-R, no, H-E-A-R-T. No, it's not five, okay, six. So chest pain. Chest pain, chest pain, chest pain. So please, that is, you can call this angina. Angina. Chest pain, dyspnea. You have dyspnea. You have difficult of breathing, difficult of breathing. Uh, dyspnea basically when your heart is failing. When your heart, tell me, when you are for many years, you have high blood pressure, and that is what we call the silent killer. Remember, hypertension is the silent killer. Silent killer. Silent killer. You can have hypertension, and basically you don't feel too much. Some headaches sometimes, but, but because it's not showing signs and symptoms, it's called the silent killer. And uh, with the time, the heart is working, working so hard, so hard that the fibers of the muscle start to get weak. And that actually produce a, what we call heart failure in the long run. Okay? So if the heart cannot pump blood into the lungs, you cannot oxygenate your blood as much as you want. So when you're doing some activity, when you're going to do some, some activity, you're going to have this lack of oxygen. So you feel dyspnea, fatigue. Can you give me a second, please? Is the school is calling me? Just a moment. Please.
Okay, so let's keep this going. Sorry for that. Okay. So just remember the Disney cough, cough, uh, uh, cough is going to be cough is going to happen when, for example, the you have uh, hypertension on the pulmonary arteries. So there is so much pressure in the pulmonary arteries. Why? Because the heart cannot pump all the blood out of the heart that the, uh, the pressure are going to make escape water into the, into the lungs. And that can lead into certain cough, cough because of dyspnea and cough. Edema, we are going to explain that in heart failure. Fatigue, we already talked about that. Palpitations is the sensation. Palpitation is not tachycardia. Palpitations are the sensation of heart activity. So you feel that the patient can say, oh, my heart. When, when you have palpitations, for example, when you run very fast for, let's put it, uh, five miles, and you very fast, your heart is boom, 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 boom. What you feel your heart is pumping out from your chest, that is palpitation. Okay? That is palpitation. It's that sensation. It's a symptom. Okay? Tachycardia is different. Tachycardia is increase of the heart rate. So you can count that. That is why it's a sign. Tachycardia is not necessarily lead into palpitations, but it's commonly seen that when somebody has tachycardia, they can still feel in that sensation that is the palpitation. Are you okay with that? Yes. 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 And syncope, please, in your in your slide, write down syncope is the same to say faint, 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 fainting. Syncope, fainting. Why are you fainting? When your heart is not pumping correctly in the heart failure, for example, there is no enough blood going into the blood stream, into the brain. Other, they can produce uh, syncope when you have medication, they can produce uh, hypotension. And the hypotension, when you are standing up, are going to feel this dizziness and faint. So basically, what is syncope means fainting. All right. All right, so let's start with some clinical history. We have a 40-year-old woman present with recurrent severe headaches, vomiting, and decreased vision. She also states that recently have been seeing spots before her eyes. So what does that mean? All right, so if you see here, what is what you are talking about, right? You have a woman with recurrent severe headaches. So headaches, uh, generally, uh, hypertension do not cause any signs and symptoms because it's called the silent killer. But when the headache, when the hypertension shows some signs and symptoms, I would say about 10 to 15% of the people are going to have some headaches. Some headaches. So few people can have headaches. And these headaches basically are happening in the occipital area, occipital area, in the occipital area, occipital, occipital area, okay? Occipital area, here on the back, okay? It's most commonly happening there. Second is that uh, if the patient is, a, is a, a hypertensive and for many years and is, doesn't know because it's a silent killer, right? So this hypertension is so much pressure inside the vessels, inside the vessels. And small vessels can rupture. One of the most common vessels that can rupture are going to be the capillaries. And one of the most common will be at the level of the retina. In the retina, we have very small vessels. So that's why when you go to the optometrist, they can actually tell you if you have, if you have risk without taking your blood pressure, they can suspect that you have hypertension because some vessels of the retina, when they go and examine your eye, are ruptured, and you will see some floaters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, all right. Another physical exam reveals uh, a blood pressure 220 over 160. Okay, so what is the normal blood pressure, please, everybody? What is the normal blood pressure? 120 over 80. All right, so 120 over 80. Very good. And what is the minimum minimum normal blood pressure? 90 over 60. 90 over 50. 50, okay? 
90 over 50, that is the, the minimum. Of course, if you have, for example, if you have increase of more than 40, so your, your basal is a, your basal is uh, a number, but your, your, uh, your blood pressure go up to 40, that is hypertension already, all right? And we will see today, we will talk about shock, when your blood pressure go down 40, especially the systolic, that is, can be shock, can be shock. All right, so that is the normal values, 90 to 50 and 100 to 20. That is the range. What is the pre, uh, pre-hypertension? 139.89. 139. 89. To 89. So that is the range. Okay? I'm going to put it here like this. Okay, so it's the normal range. And then we have the prehypertension will be how much? 139.89. Perfect. And stage one? Huh? Stage one? 149, 90, 140, 90. Uh, always I have this problem. Uh. Okay. And it says two. 160 over 100. Okay. All right. So that, so everybody knows that the rule of 99, right? 99. So you make a summation of 19, 19, 19. That is going to give you the stage one and stage two. The 999, that is going to be that diastolic pressure. Okay. Everybody got it? Okay. So now, stage one, you need only one drug. Stage two, you basically are going to use two drugs. Stage one, one. Stage two, two. So in all of them are going to be uh, physical activity. So you're going to do physical activity. So mild physical activity. So your diet, physical activity and diet. So basically your habits, okay? Lifestyle. Lifestyle, pre-hypertension, lifestyle, uh, uh, stage one, lifestyle, uh, stage two. In addition to that, in the pre-hypertension, you don't do any medication at all. You don't do any medication. In stage one, you start to have one medication, especially the thiazides. Okay, so those are the first drugs we're using. And the stage two, you're using two drugs. Okay, we got it? Physical exam reveals blood pressure 225 over 60. What stage is that? Please, if you don't collaborate, I'm not going to be able to finish the course. The lecture. Stage two. Okay. Yeah. So stage two. And the heart rate is 72 beats per minute. So that is in the normal range. What is the normal range of the heartbeat? It's going to be 60 to 100. EKG reveals left ventricle hypertrophy. So what that means left, left ventricle hypertrophy? Left ventricle, left ventricle are going to be when you are doing too much exercise what happened with your muscles when you have biceps you do a lot of biceps what happened with the muscle they start to be bigger Bro, right? Right? so that muscle become hypertrophic hypertrophy that's what you're doing when you're doing exercises when the heart have too much blood high blood pressure they need to push harder and the, it's like you're doing exercises with your biceps right and this heart start to get enlarged. That is going to be hypertrophy. What is the importance about that? The muscle get bigger, but the cavity start to get smaller because the cavity is not enlarging. 
the cavity is going to be more thinner, more narrow. Why? Because the walls of the left ventricle are getting bigger. Okay? And that can that is basically telling you that the patient is a long-term hypertensive, most likely. So 225 or 100 cc, there's no doubt. That is uh, the patient is hypertensive. Laboratory uh, examination reveals uh, increase of BUN. What is BUN? Blood urea and nitrogen. And why is elevated? Why the blood urea, urea, nitrogen is elevated? Because you cannot eliminate the urea. Where is coming the urea from? The metabolic process of the proteins. So you cannot, 10 to 20 is the normal value. So when you have too much nitrogen in your, in your blood, because it's a blood test, it's a blood test, a blood test, that means that you cannot eliminate the urea. And what does it mean? That the kidney is being damaged. What, which portion is going to be the excretion, fresh filtration, reabsorption, excretion, secretion, and hormones. So one of these, the kidney is being damaged. Why? Because the afferent and the efferent are suffering from that, actually, blood pressure. All right, so I will explain you a little bit about this. The high, high blood pressure. What happened with the arteries and what happened with the veins? Why is it important to control the hypertension in early stages? You already know the patient with long data of hypertension, the more time passing, more difficult to control the blood pressure. Do you notice that? So they're going to start to do a lot of combinations here and there, but it's more difficult. Why is that? Why is that? So listen to this. We have blood pressure equal cardiac output times peripheral resistance. I'm going to make a remark here. So what happened with the artery? This is a normal artery. The artery are going to receive the, the pulse, all right? So boom, boom. So all the blood is going to make the, vas the vessels dilate and constrict, dilate and constrict, dilate and constrict. That is the pulse. So why you have pulse? Because the heart, when it's pumping, pumping is like you are shaking the blanket of your, of your, in your bed. Shaking the blanket, you have waves that are going to be transmitted through the blanket. So your hands is the heart, and the blanket is the equivalent to, say, the artery. So that's why you have these pulses. And what happened, the, the vessels are going to dilate and contract, dilate and contract. That is your pulse, dilate and contract. So muscle contraction and relaxation. Contraction, re that is because the vessels, arteries, they have a smooth muscle in the tunica media. Now, if you have too much, if you have too much, uh, if you have too much uh, uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure, you are doing this process, but with higher pressures. It's like you are doing exercises with your muscles. So what happened with your muscles? It become hypertrophy, it start to get bigger. And these vessels, the tunica media start to get thicker. And the lumen of the vessel start to diminish. And that means that you are increasing the peripheral resistance. And that means that you are increasing the blood pressure. Now, if you follow me, you can tell the afferent and the efferent arteries of the, of the, of the blood are going to be affected too, of the, of the kidney, sorry, are going to be affected. The, the capillaries is already, you know, the capillaries, the, like the glomerulus, the capillary is just so tiny that only just one red blood cell at a time can pass. Only the size of one red blood cell can pass. So if you have in the long run hypertension, this lining of the capillaries are going to get thicker and there is no basically blood passing into the kidney. The kidney starts to have a problem. And the kidney, when that happens, there is another mechanism here that you need to remember the kidney said, oh, I don't receive enough blood because the capillaries are going to be very narrow. They don't receive blood. So I'm going to die. So what I need to do is, oh, I need to increase the blood pressure. So what is doing the kidney? The kidney is going to release the renin because the, the kidney thinks that it's not receiving blood because it's a low blood pressure. You release renin and that is going to be even worse, your blood, your, your blood pressure. 
So that's why you need to control your hypertension in early stages, because later on are going to be more difficult to be controlled. Serum creatine, creatine is a waste product are going to be elevated. Plasma renin are going to be elevated. Angiotensin is going to be elevated. And the RAS and renin are going to increase your aldosterone. So that is a vicious circle. You're going to get even worse. So the patient is basically at this moment totally uh, not being under control. So they need to have uh, actually a treatment right away. Okay, so we okay with that? Yes. Okay, so let's, uh, okay, so I'm going to finish about the 11. So tell me at 11, please, okay? All right, so hypertension, condition in which the blood pressure in the arteries is elevated. So increase the systolic pressure, increase the diastolic pressure, or both, or both. Major risk for complications, stroke, myocardial infarction, kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease. So you already understand that. I hope so. So stroke, why? Because the blood, listen, the blood is going to run one yard per second. That is what is the velocity of the velocity of the blood. If you have, if you have, this is the artery, and if you have here cholesterol, cholesterol like this, this cholesterol deposit with the blood friction, the friction of the velocity, they're going to dislodge a piece of the cholesterol. And this is going to travel and block vessels in the, in the, in the brain. And they can lead into a stroke. Okay? The same thing. See, if you have cholesterol in the coronary arteries, these coronary arteries, when you have high blood pressure, these coronary arteries with the atherosclerosis, they're going to dislodge a piece because too much friction, a lot of velocity, a lot of velocity. So that is basically uh, can dislodge and can produce blockage on, uh, on one of the branches that give blood supply to the myocardium, producing myocardial infarction. And the same thing here, hypertension. Hypertension, the normal vessel is like this, without hypertension. With hypertension, what happened in the long run is not immediately. On the long run, it's going to be the, the vessel the same size, but the lumen is going to be narrow. Why? because these muscles are getting hypertrophy. And that is going to affect the afferent and the efferent arterial of the kidney. And the kidney is going to start destroying, so there is going to have less and less, less nephrons. Why? Because there is not enough blood, blood and oxygen, so they need to die, okay? Major risks or complications are going to be the brain, the heart, the kidney. Brain, heart, kidney. Brain, heart, kidney. Brain, heart, kidney. So this is the, uh, the blood pressure that we was talking about, all right? So that is a stage one, a stage two, and uh, we have high prehypertension and normal. The rule of 19.9, that is what I, I, I make you easy to remember. All right, so what are the goals? The goals are going to be uh, uh, to have the blood pressure less than 140 uh, over 90 without other history or other conditions. So this is a must, please. You, When you have my pharmacology uh, treatment, you need to have your blood pressure less than 140. If you have hypertension, I know my blood pressure should be 120 over 80. That is the ideal. But if you're hypertensive, you want to minimize the damage, making the blood pressure should be less systolic, less than 140. Oh, and the diastolic less than 90. So that is when the patient is not having any other disease, any other disease. But you need to be more strict, even because you have a precondition, diabetes mellitus, or chronic diseases, where in order to tell that your goal, what is your goal to control the blood pressure, in this case, will be more strict, less than 130 over 80. So that is when you have diabetes mellitus or another pathology involving the heart. Okay, we, go, we okay with that? Yes. Tell me, hypertension, can we cure hypertension? Yes or no? No. You said no? 
o no? No. Excellent. No. So hypertension is not curable. Hypertension is basically uh, under control. So we have two types of hypertension. You already passed medsers. Illustrate me. How many, what is that are the type of hypertension that we have? Very fast, please, please. Go ahead. And we can bear forward. Uh, everybody's talking about the same the ortho time. orthostatic hypertension? No, no, no. Oh, what, no. What, what, what is the question, is, Dr. G? What is the classification of hypertension or the types of hypertension? <clears throat> Type of hypertension. You're, you're already talking primary about the, the primary and essential? Exactly. That is what I want to hear. The primary, listen, all essential. That is it's not an essential. It's all essential. It's the same. And the other one is the secondary. Primary or essential? Essential means that we don't know what is the cause. We don't know what is the cause. Primary, primary. The 90% of all high blood pressures are going to be primary or essential. We don't know the cause. Secondary, it could be many other pathologies that we know the cause. For example, one of those is the renal artery stenosis. When you have a narrowing of the renal artery, the kidney is thinking that you don't have enough blood pressure because it's not uh, the kidney is not receiving blood. So what is doing the, the body is to release renin. And the renin activates the RAS system, increasing the blood pressure. So don't forget that, please. The, the types of hypertension, we have primary, that is 90% of the cases, and the other 10%, very simple subtraction, are going to be the secondary. Okay, we okay with that? Yes. All right, so okay. when you have hypertensive, sorry, 11? Yeah, can we take a break? Yes. Who, who is this, Jacob? No, Christian. Christian, you like a break, huh? No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's uh, have our 10 minutes. I will see you at 11.15, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Hello?
Hello. Hello? Hi. Hey, Dr. G. Hi, Dr. G. Uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel? Nathaniel? Okay. All right, so that's, that's good. I getting the booster shot right now. Sorry? I think Nate went to go get his booster shot at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, stay with the with the cell phone, please, Nathaniel, okay? All right. So okay. well, that number. Yeah, that's what I was request to to ask to tell you. All right, so let's keep going. All right, so when you have hypertensive emergency, when you have an emergency hyper, uh, hypertension is when you have your blood pressure more than 180 over 120. Okay? So, yes, that is the, 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 the frames that you need to look for always. So, that is an emergency. You need to go to the uh, ER. And actually, there can be a, an imminent acute myocardial infarction. Why? Because the cholesterol, the cholesterol can be anytime can be detached because too much pressure, and these the artery, coronary arteries block. They can be actually a detachment of a piece of the of the cholesterol and can lead into a stroke. A stroke. I mean, acute myocardial infarction. Okay, they can be produced into a stroke. A stroke, myocardial infarction. So that is the problem with the. Uh, hypertensive emergency. We okay with that? Yes. All right. So medication administration, short uh, checklist, Trump, you already know that. Time, route, amount, medication, and patients. So that is something that you need to be careful with the medications when we're talking about hypertension. We have uh, two types of or the classification of hypertension or types of hypertension. Primary hypertension, essential. We don't know that. That is uh, basically the, the uh, unknown, right? So 90% of the cases are going to be like that. And secondary hypertension will be other problems. It could be adrenal, problem, adrenal gland problems, to, uh, especially of the medulla. You can produce too much adrenaline, or you can have uh, actually a, a hypersecretion of aldosterone. So all the components that you already know can lead if we know what is the cause of that, that is a secondary hypertension. The one I want you to remember is the uh, uh, renal artery stenosis, RAS, RAS. Renal artery, don't confuse with RAS, the other one, the renin and jotensin. RAS is R-A-S, re renal artery stenosis, okay? Even uh, the minutes of five millimeters of mercury in the systolic pressure, we can decrease the risk of strokes in 74% and decrease your uh, risk for uh, myocardial infarction in 20%. So that is what we was mentioning at the very beginning. So how we are going to uh, achieve that with the uh, patient education, lifestyle, okay? Again, what is doing this here? I put it again, okay. A nursing assessment, so you already know you need to know the nursing assessment. So the nursing assessment is going to start with what? It's going to start with the clinical history. The clinical history. Clinical history. You're going to the present. What is the present? The present will be the main complaint. The main complaint. 
then you're going to do the history, the past, past, past history. So you go into collect all your objective and your subjective data, right? So that is basically the clinical history. Then after that, you're going to do what? You're going to do your vital signs, your vital signs, the vital signs. You start to keep in the back of your head is there is actually some laboratory tests that you can uh, you can do. Laboratory tests will be if you suspect, for example, some problems of myocardial infarction or a stroke. So there are going to be lab laboratory tests that most likely they are going to be requested. You need to be alert on that. And then after that, you're going to do your physical exam. Your physical exam basically are going to be a focalized physical exam. Focalized in relation to the heart. So you're going to do your blood pressure again. You're going to do your uh, your auscultation, right? Auscultation of the heart. Uh, there's uh, some murmurs, etc. And uh, basically, you need to check for remember the cardinal signs of uh, of, uh, of of the heart will be, for example, a short of breath, SOB, SOB, SOB. It could be edemas, 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 or syncope. So all these cardinal signs need to be followed. Or oh, chest pain, chest pain, chest pain, right? Chest pain, fatigue, dyspnea, uh, palpitations, uh, edemas, lower extremities, especially in the lower extremities, we will see that in heart failure. All right, so in this, you need to monitor and record the blood pressure. So you need to uh, put the patient in the in monitor in order to uh, basically uh, 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 follow up the blood pressure. Uh, measure in both arms three times, three to five minutes apart while the patient is at rest. Okay, then sitting and then standing for initial evaluation. So that is standing or uh, or sitting are going to be very valuable because the, when you have sitting up or uh, or standing up, the variation of the blood pressure shouldn't be more than twenty millimeters of mercury in the in the in the systolic systolic so you cannot have more than 20 otherwise it can tell you that could be some uh, some uh, can be some stenosis or some uh, problems or blockage of some of the artery so they need to be no more different difference between 20 millimeters of mercury in the reading first reading is a uh, it is a severe hypertension that the systolic pressure is more than 110. Second reading is that the systolic pressure more than 120 is considered first accelerate and they can be malignant, severe. So you need to check to on that diastolic pressure. So the systolic pressure more than 110 or 120, that is very bad sign, very bad sign. All right, so systolic pressure are going to be basically telling you if you have too much, uh, too high systolic pressure, there can be problems with cerebrovascular disease, like strokes. <clears throat> the systolic pressure is going to be risk for ischemic heart disease. So, the systolic pressure hypertension means ischemia of the heart can lead into ischemia of the heart. Uh, systolic hypertension high risk for for strokes. All right, so. Continuing to the nursing assessment, you need to do the uh, comparison of the pulses, okay? Comparison of the pulses. Uh, the pulses should be symmetrical. So the, the tension of the pulse in one side, when the, the pressure that the pulse happen in your, in your fingers should be the same pressure that you feel on both arms. So, <clears throat> so we have other problems like uh, carotid artery, uh, that is mostly happening in heart failure. Uh, we have actually bounding carotid artery jugular radial means that it's too hard. It's like jumping out of your of the skin of the patient. It's very intense the pain. So uh, the pulse. All right. So uh, and many others. So that is part of the uh, med search. So I'm not going to go on that because it's a lot of to explain, and especially it's going to be clear when we talk about heart failure. All right, so let's keep doing that. All right, so related to what our, our topic is, uh, uh, we are going to have one of the 
Enkrich's question that I'm looking in pharmacology is the fundoscopy. 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 Fundoscopy is when they check your, your eyes, right? So that is part of your nerve assessment, right? So, and you will see papilledema. Papilledema. What is papilledema? Papilledema is a question for English, so you need to be alert on that. Papilledema is when you have the optic disc. The optic disc is being uh, having edema. So here we have the entry of the entry of the of the optic nerve, and you can see this is a swollen 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 area edema. That is a sign of hypertension. Oh, here we have some bleeding. This bleeding are like a, appearing like a cottons here, cottons and some redness around. That means that there's a rupture of the retina when uh, reti retinal vessels that can cause this uh, problem. So rupture because of the hypertension. All right, so just remember, silent killer, occipital headache upon awakening. So basically in the morning, I forgot to mention that especially in the morning, so you feel some heaviness on the neck, you have some headache on the occipital lobe. In the morning, when you, that is the most common, when it's going to give, uh, when it's going to give some signs and symptoms. That is basically 10 to 15% of the people. Not everybody has that. If you are lucky to have it, that is telling you, okay, so there's a problem with blood pressure. All right. So that is about the general scenes of assessment. If you can tell, it's more elaborate than you think, and uh, uh, we are going to get into that and get used on to do those assessments. But the first part I mentioned, how to monitor the patient, how to recognize is a, a, a emergency hypertension. So that is actually what I want you to remember. So I'm trying to set the frame of the patient in order to give the appropriate medication. All right, so now let's talk about the medication of hypertension. The medication of hypertension, now you're going to use everything that we was talking in the past in bioscience, in anatomy, physiology, in med search, and with that is the moment that we are going to apply everything. All right, so very simple. So if you know the A, B, C, and D, the A, B, C, and D, you know basically the treatment for hypertension. Basically, you know the treatment for heart failure, heart failure and hypertension. So that is, I put it together in order to be easier to remember. You have the A, B, C, and D. What is A? A will be, I'm going to start with the Christmas tree, is the ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor. What is the ACE inhibitor? ACE inhibitor is the angiotensin Convertase enzyme. And what is this? This angiotensin convertase enzyme. You have the kidney here. This is the kidney. This is the kidney. The kidney. Here is the liver. Here is the are the lungs. Here is the adrenal gland. All right. And you know that this is produced the renin. The renin. The renin is going to be transformed in angiotensin 1. Angioten, angiotensin 1. So this is an enzyme that is going to transform the uh, 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 an, uh, substance in the liver into angiotensin 1. That enzyme that is going to produce the angiotensin 1 is blocked. So if you block the angiotensin 1, you cannot have angiotensin 2 you do not have the stimulation of the adrenal gland to produce aldosterone. You don't have aldosterone produced as, as before. So aldosterone, if you block, there is no absorption of sodium. There is no absorption of sodium. There is no <coughs> absorption of sodium, and there is no entry of water. And the cardiac output go down. And you already know that the blood pressure is equal cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. If you decrease the cardiac output because there is going to inhibit, so the production of aldosterone, because you can cut it here, 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 but this drug, what is going to cut is the formation of the angiotensin 1. If this angiotensin 1 is not formed, you cannot produce aldosterone. So you don't retain water, so your cardiac output goes down. You okay with that? Yes. So the 
the name of this drug is angiotensin convertase enzyme inhibitor. Don't forget that inhibitor. It's called the ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor. What is the ACE inhibitor? The angiotensin convertase enzyme inhibitor. That is the enzyme that decreases the production of angio-1 and there is no aldosterone at the end because of the RAS system, right? It's going to, you know, the RAS system. <clears throat> angiotensin uh, receptor blocker ARBs, 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 at, are going to be the other drug that is going to not block the enzyme, but is going to block the receptors where this enzyme is going to work. So that is the ARBs, 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 okay? Alpha-1 are alpha-1 blockers or antagonists. Alpha-1, alpha-1 agonist or alpha-1 alone is going to produce vasoconstriction. If you inhibit the receptor for alpha-1, you promote the vasodilation, vasodilation, vasodilation. We have the, <coughs> the beta blockers. The beta blockers, the beta blockers are going to basically block the receptor for beta-1. What is doing beta-1? Beta-1 increase the heart rate and increase contractility. Contractility, contractility. So that is doing beta-1. So in beta-1, you have this contraction, you're going to have this contraction. Harder. But if you block the beta-1 with beta blockers, beta blockers, they are going to basically uh, decrease the contractility, making less effort to the heart, less pressure, and the pressure, the pressure go down. Beta blockers. Listen to this. I, this is very important. Beta blockers, I said beta blockers, so be, means beta 1, beta 2. No, this is beta 1. We, beta blockers is related to beta 1 blocker, beta 1 blocker. Why? Because you do not have beta 2 blocker. <clears throat> In medicine, we don't have, we don't want to have beta 2 blocker because beta 2 blocker, <clears throat> beta 2 blocker, what is doing is bronchoconstriction. You're going to suffocate the patient. So there is no such medication. Okay? So that's why we call beta blocker means beta 1 blocker or beta 1 antagonist. Are you okay with that? Hello. Come yes. On. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. So don't get behind because, because it's important. So please just let me know if you want me to repeat. And the calcium channel blockers, you already know, this is all news, calcium channel blockers. So calcium do not enter to make the contraction of the, of the vessel, of the vessel. And the contraction of the heart is going to be more easier because it's not going to have a calcium uh, in big amounts to make that contractility. So that's why it's called calcium channel blockers. So what is promoting is the vasodilation, vasodilation, so calcium produces basal const uh, promote the constriction of the smooth muscle, basal constriction. But if you block partially, it's blocking partially the calcium channels getting into the cell, what happened? The muscle promotes the relaxation, relaxation. In the heart, what it's doing is to decrease the contractility. Instead of doing this, they're going to do this. So less, less effort, okay? All right, so that is basically the A, B, C, D. The D are going to be the diuretics, diuretics. So just remember now. So the, the, the base I want you to remember is this. Number one, ACE inhibitors. Number two, beta blockers. Number three, calcium channel blockers. And number, uh, and, and number, and the D is the diuretic. So this is the Christmas tree I want you to remember. And the other ones, we are going to see that in the in the way just a moment so what are those are going to be ACE inhibitors beta blockers calcium channel blockers and diuretics <clears throat> okay can you repeat that after me please what is the first one ACE inhibitors a B, beta blockers. Beta, beta blockers. C, calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers. And that, diuretics. 
Now, I want everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes and imagine A, B, C, D. A, ACE inhibitors. B, beta blockers. C, calcium channel blockers. D, diuretics. Okay? All right. So, if you know that, if you can say that, you already know the basic treatment of hypertension. All right, so let's keep moving. A, B, C, D. All right, so here we have the different type of drugs that we are going to talk today. All right, so we have the ACE inhibitors. We have the calcium channel blockers here. The rest we are going to go by by one. ACE inhibitors, the uh, B, where is the beta blockers? Beta blockers. We have C, the uh, calcium channel blockers, CCB, calcium channel blockers. And we have the diuretics, diuretics. Okay, so those are the Christmas tree I want you to remember. <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's see what is happening. So this is the angiotensin that we already, the RAS, this is the RAS that you must know from your previous courses. So any, any pathway, you can, you can block from the kidney to the liver, the renin, block. That is a, one of the treatments. So there is a medication who are going to block the renin. We have other treatment that go from the, the, they actually block the production of angiotensin 1 in angiotensin 2, another medication. Another medication can block the angiotensin 2 to, the, uh, to make release aldosterone in the adrenal gland. There is another medication. And another medication will be the blockage of the aldosterone. And any of these treatments are going to decrease basically the reabsorption of sodium in any steps. And then step, you you block one of these, and as a resultant, it's not going to produce aldosterone, so that means there is no reabsorption of sodium. Okay? Okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So we have the cardiac output is, the uh, we have the blood pressure is the blood pressure, just to give you in this format, cardiac output times peripheral resistance. All right? So if you increase peripheral resistance, you increase the blood pressure. You decrease the peripheral, decrease, decrease peripheral resistance, you decrease the blood pressure. So what is the cardiac output? <clears throat> the cardiac output is the stroke volume. A stroke volume. A stroke volume. So basically that is related, the stroke volume are going to be related to how much blood are coming into the heart. So the more blood you have, the stroke volume is going to be higher. Right, so the more volume of blood you have in your in, in your system, the stroke volume should be higher, right? A stroke volume times the the heart rate. The heart rate. The heart rate is going to be uh, 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 the more heart rate, the more cardiac output. The more stroke volume, the more what we call venous return. Venous return. Venous return. So. The more stroke volume is because there is more venous return. The less stroke volume is because you have less venous return. Okay, we got it? That is the base. Okay, so let's get, get start to have fun. All right, so let's make have fun here. All right, so ACE inhibitors. The, the suffix for this ACE inhibitor will be pril. Pril. Benzapril, captopril. So how, do you know how I remember this? I remember because I'm trying to remember, remember that. ACE inhibitor starts with A. So actually I will say April, 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 the month April. April it means ACE inhibitors are going to end in pril, right? So what are those? Those are the ben, benazepril, the captopril, the captopril is the uh, actually is the most common. Okay, uh, all right, <laughs> all right. So we have here that the captopril is not a pro drug. It's not a pro drug. So this is basically the medication, the active medication that you take in the pill. That is what is exactly going to to because it's not going to need. It's not need to be processed by the liver. So basically, you are taking an active medication uh, uh, at the time you're taking the, the, the tablet, the captopril. 
capital premium. All right, so what are doing this? This, what is doing is to block the angiotensin one. So they're blocking the angiotensin one, you cannot produce angiotensin two and etc. Okay, so this is can be, uh, uh, and we, we will go uh, into, into more details now. So second, these a, a, uh, ACE inhibitors, these ACE inhibitors are not effective in African-American population, all right? It's not, it's not effective as effective in African-American population. So ACE inhibitors, when you give it to a patient with Afro-African-American uh, population, you need to be associated with other medication in order to be effective, these ACE inhibitors. And that is where we are going to use is the diuretics. Diuretics, especially the thiazides. thiazides. We already talked about the thiazides, right? Thiazides, remember the loop diuretics, remember the uh, potassium sparing diuretics, and you remember the thiazides, correct? All right? Without mention the carbon, uh, the carbon anhydrase inhibitor, and uh, and uh, and the other one, the mannitol. Those are actually the five diuretics that we are looking at. So in this case, you're going to use the first line. The first line of diuretics are going to be the thiazides. You can start in stage one with one drug with thiazides, or you can, in this case, you uh, if you use calcium channel blockers, you in African American, you need to add some diuretic thiazide. Okay? You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So one thing, these ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, it's the first one, so please just remember that it is known that it's protecting the heart. Why? Because the, the kidneys. The kidney because this ACE inhibitor, the receptors are going to be very, have high affinity to the kidney, producing vasodilation of the kidney. So basically, the ACE inhibitors are going to be a protective of the kidney, kidney protective. So some people who have diabetes mellitus, diabetes mellitus, they develop nephropathies, means pathology of the kidney. And the pathophysiology will be another time. But the, key, the, the number one cause, number one cause of kidney transplants are going to be caused by diabetes mellitus. So the kidney is going to be very much affected in patients with diabetes. And actually, diabetes mellitus, uh, diabetes always produce some hypertension, okay? They can, one of the complications in the long run, five, 10 years, are going to start developing hypertension. Do you know somebody with diabetes mellitus? They suffer from hypertension, most likely, okay? All right, so that is the ACE inhibitors. Okay. So please, I want you to remember this forever. Any hypertensive medication, any, any anti-hypertensive medication, what is the main purpose? To decrease or reduce the blood pressure, correct? Okay, so what could be the side effect of all anti-hypertensive? Doesn't matter which one, all anti-hypertensive. The side effect will be that you have orthostatic hypotension. If you exaggerate the action of the drug, of any drug, that is going to lead you into the side effect. So if you have a patient with hypertension and you give the medication, okay, it's lower, it's going to lower the blood pressure, good. But if you give too much medication, the side effect will be actually to lower, too low the blood pressure. And that leads into orthostatic hyper hypotension, hyperstatic hypotension. You okay? You okay with that? Yes. That yes. is the general for all antihypertensive. All right, so whole medication of contact. Sorry? I have a question regarding that one. So um, can a person be diagnosed with hypertension and hypotension at the same time because of the medication or is no. it? No, so I, I am hypertensive, okay? I take a medication, I have my my blood pressure okay, okay, below 140, right? Uh, but if I have uh, excess of medication, all right? For example, you make a mistake and you take, oh, I forget my pill, I take twice. 
the pill, that is not right. So you need to, if you skip one day, you need to just keep doing the same dose every day, no overdose. And that can lead into side effects. So it's going to lower too much yeah, the, the blood pressure. If that medication lower too much, after you have hypertension, go to normal, then you can have this orthostatic hypotension. Okay, so that is a consequence of the medication, orthostatic hypotension. You cannot have hypo and hyper at the same time, right? Or it's hypo, or it's normal, or it's hypertension, right? So that is about. So I don't know if that, that was your question. Oh, no, my question was, because um, I have a patient diagnosed with hypertension and hypotension. I was asking if the hypotension is usually diagnosed because of the drug they're taking for hypertension. Exactly. Exactly. That is because of the drug. So the patient have high risk to, in this case, you have hypertension and they, they then after that, they put you hypotension. So that, need, that means that the patient need to be careful with the drugs. They need to be the precise dose. Otherwise, it's going to lead into hypotension. Okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so uh, all right. So if we have here, you need to hold the medication, and that is for all anti antihypertensive. Huh? If your blood pressure is going to be lower, systolic, less than 100 millimeters of mercury, you need to hold the medication. You need to hold the medication. You need to hold the medication. So that's why before you give the medication, you give the you take the blood pressure. And after you give the medication, the medi you need to take the blood pressure. No, immediately. Yeah? You need to wait until the drug is depends. It's a PO. You start to make a, the uh, follow-up blood pressure in half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour. We okay with that? But you need to, when the blood pressure starts to go lower than 100, 100 means 99, 99 or 100, in this case equal, uh, le no, it's 99 99 less than 100 that is actually you need to hold the medication because if you give it more the patient is going to have a severe hypotension okay yes yes okay so now let's talk about the side effects another side effects are going to be this is very important look at the heads please look at the heads is what we call the first dose effect. If the patient is going to take for the first time the medication, that medication can literally lower the pressure very much and dramatically down. So you need to be careful with the first dose effect. And what is going to be that effect? Is going to be orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension. So you need to, uh, what is your di nursing diagnosis there? Risk for falls risk for injuries correct why because if the patient is going to stand up very fast they are going to faint and fall so you need to do you already know how to deal with the patients to leave uh, to uh, come out from the bed right you know you already know that or no yes okay so one of these is to stand up the patient slowly and with assistance right and they go to the bathroom. You need to go to the patient with the bathroom, right? In the bathroom, in the bathroom, with the in the with the patient, right? So because they have risk for falls, or oh, yes, you give the urinary or the or actually the other one for uh, to do uh, uh, stools. Another thing is that a, a, you need to pump the legs. You can pump the legs so passively. So the patient is laying down in bed. You're going to move the leg like this. one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, like that's fast. One, two, no, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then you can actually uh, make the patient stand up slowly again. So why you are doing that? Because when you are doing that contraction of the muscles, there is more blood coming into the heart. So that is going to uh, basically prevent or minimize the effect of hypotension. Hypotension. Okay. All right. This can produce hyperkalemia. 
hyperkalemia because it's going to uh, actually, you know, uh, uh, hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia. Actually, what happened is that when you have uh, uh, ACE inhibitors, what happened? The kidney is going to start to retain potassium. Hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia. All right. So the side effect I want you to remember about ACE inhibitors are the angioedema, 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 angioedema. Look at that face, especially on the right side. So this is the Wink's uh, allergic reaction in kids. Kids doesn't have hypertension. So, but similar happen in adults. So that face is swollen. The eyelids, the cheeks, the lips even are going to be swollen. And that is called the angioedema. That is the side effect of the ACE inhibitors. Angioedema. Don't forget that. Second, you're going to have the cough. Dry cough. is going to have dry cough. Dry cough. Dry cough. Write down this. Dry cough. 33% of the patient can have dry cough. Dry cough. It's not clear why is that happening, but it's producing dry cough. When that happens, you need to change medication. When you, when you have this dry cough in ACE inhibitors, you need to change medication. Which medication is going to be that? It's going to be mostly changed to ARBs, the uh, angiotensin receptor blocker. ARBs, that is the one who is coming later. So when you have dry cough, you need to basically change the medication to another one that is the ARBs, A-R-B. Okay? All right. And we have electrolyte imbalance, electrolyte imbalance, electrolyte imbalance. What is going to be the electrolyte imbalance? Are going to be hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia. It's going to be hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia. Okay? All right. So we have uh, I, if you see here, um, where well, we have inhibitors, okay? We have I is initial dose. You need to be careful. Please, this is huge. And don't mix it with NSAIDs. No aspirin. ACE, AAA aspirin, no AAA, no with AAAs inhibitors. Okay, because that is going to decrease the effect of the ACE inhibitors. All right? So ACE inhibitors. H means hyperkalemia. H hyperkalemia. H hyperkalemia. So that is basically ACE inhibitor. If you remember the mnemonic, ACE, ACE, A, angioedema, C, cough, E, electrolyte imbalance, what? Hyperkalemia. Inhibitor, I, N, H, if you want. I, initial dose. They can have uh, actually the first dose effect. N, do not mix with NSAIDs. Don't give it with NSAIDs. No NSAIDs. No NSAIDs. Okay? Inhibitor. Inhibit H again the hyperkalemia. Okay, so birth defects they are not going to ask you that much, but yes, I need to mention that. So easy to know the ACE inhibitors. What is the drug that we are looking at? Is this captopril, capotin, capotin? This is not a prodrug. Okay, we have a benazepril, pril, 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 ACE inhibitors, enalapril, enalapril. Pril, 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 uh, ACE inhibitors, moxipril, unib unibask, that is uh, pril, 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 ACE inhibitors. So what you need to remember is that what is the action? What is the mechanism of action? Second, what are the uses for, right? So hypertension, heart failure, and they are going to not be effective in African American. So protecting again, uh, is a kidney protector. Then we have the side effects. The side effects are going to be for the uh, uh, the uh, ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, A angioedema, cough, electrolyte imbalance, hyperkalemia, initial dose, first dose effect, and not mix it with NSAIDs. Be okay with that? Yes. Okay. The second drug that we are going to talk is the. Uh, uh, ARBs. So I don't like to mention Satan, but they look like a Sartan. Sartan. ARBs. 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 ARB R is what is giving you the clue. R. If you put S at the beginning, you have SAR. ARBs. 
this S going down in the, on, on the beginning, Sar, Sartan. Sartan is the Olme Sartan, the Benicar, very common, can desarcan, at, atacan, so another medication, but the most common is the Olme Sartan. You don't need to remember very much the, the names, but if you have a good memorization of the suffix that is telling you, basically, the, uh, the clue. All right, so what is art? Art is going to bind the receptors, in this case of the angiotensin 2. So uh, just remember the name, very simple, receptors, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker is going to block the receptors for angiotensin 2, right? So if they don't find the receptor for angiotensin 2, they are not going to be the next step, that is to produce aldosterone in the adrenal gland. Again, this A is not actually useful for African-American population, unless you are going to use with another medication. So this lower pressure, look at this. I'm talking about hypertension, and in the previous and this one, they mentioned about heart failure. Heart failure. What is the heart failure? Heart failure, very simple. Look at this. Heart failure is one of the causes is after myocardial infarction. So infarction means partially uh, they're going to, part of the muscle is dead. Part of the muscle is dead. It's like you, I want you to walk and run, let's run, but I take a piece of your muscle of your legs. Can you run as before? No. So because that remove of the muscle is like you kill that part of the muscle. And that is what happened with the heart. The heart as you cannot run if you don't have the whole muscles complete. So, and the whole muscles are incomplete because the patient was having a myocardial infarction. And the heart is not going to, uh, is not going to uh, run, is not going to beat as before. It's going to fail to run, to fail to pump. And that is what we call uh, heart failure, heart failure. All right, so both are going to be used for heart failure the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. Now, these neither are going to be used for African-American population unless you use another medication. Okay? These, again, Sartan and uh, Pril are going to cause hyperkalemia. This is a very high yield topic in NCLEX, hyperkalemia. ARBs and ARBs and ACE can lead into hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the alpha one blocker, alpha one blocker, alpha one itself, alpha one or alpha one agonist is basal produce basal constriction. But we are talking about the alpha one blocker. Alpha alpha one blocker are going to produce a, a blocking the basal constriction. So what is the resultant? The resultant is to produce vasodilation. It's going to cause vasodilation. What is the uh, what is the what what is the suffix? Is the sosin, 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 prasosin, doxasosin. Don't get confused. When we are going to use this alpha one, basically in critical situations. So when the patient is in the hospital, the patient, in order to control very quick and fast the uh, alpha one blocker, the hypertension, you're going to give alpha one blocker alpha-1 blocker. We need to be careful with, uh, again, the first dose effect that can lead into hypotension, hypotension, alpha-1 blocker. So when we are going to use this, basically in emergencies, okay, in hypertensive crisis. So that is where mostly we have alpha-1 blocker. The other ones, the the, the ACE inhibitors and, uh, and uh, uh, ARPs are going to be used for medication for maintenance, for treatment right? At home, whatever they are. All right, so to, talking about the beta blocker, okay? All right, so the beta blocker, the beta blocker are going to be, the suffix is going to be low, low, low. When you text, you, you have text, you're texting, all right? The text, low, you're doing, you're sending, you're, yeah, that is the suffix for beta blocker. The most common, the most common or the most, the prototype is going to be the propranolol. Propranolol. 
lo, 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 lo. So propanolol, propanolol, okay? This propanolol is no selective. I'm going to talk about it. Propanolol is a lot, okay? No selective. And atenolol is a selective one. So I'm going to tell you why is that. All right. So what is doing the beta, beta blocker? All right. So number one, you need to remember the beta one is going to increase the heart rate and the contractility. The beta-1 blocker, most commonly called blocker, you can call beta-1 antagonist, okay? So the beta-1 blocker, what is, are going to have two effects. Chronotropic effect and inotropic effect. The chronotropic, chrono, chronos means is the, the, I mean, the god of the mythology, right? Chronos means time. And I know means pressure or force. Time and force. So what is doing the beta one, the beta one is going to accelerate, accelerate the beta one, it is one. It's going to accelerate the heart rate. That means that it's chronotropic positive positive. The inotropic, positive. Why? Because the beta-1 adrenaline, for example, are going to increase the, the, uh, the force of contraction of the muscle. The beta-1 blocker, that is what you need to remember, it's very important, is going to be the opposite. N uh, cr negative chronotropic and positive chronotropic, or chronotropic negative or inotropic neg positive. Oh, sorry, negative too. All of them are negative. So, Beta-1 blocker is going to be chrono-negative and inot-negative. So that is going to decrease the contractility of the heart, the, the strength of contraction of the heart. That is inotropic negative. And the chronotropic negative is going to decrease the heart rate. So what is the beta-1 blocker? We have is chronotropic negative and inotropic negative. Is that clear, please? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the beta one blocker, the beta one blocker, are actually you need to be careful when you're going to give the medication. What is the normal heart rate? The normal heart rate is sixty to one hundred. When you have below sixty, uh, you cannot give the beta blocker because that can produce bradycardia and can produce cardiac arrest. So that's why you need, before to give the medication, you need to check the viral signs in your nursing process. In your nursing process. You okay with that? So, all right, so the patient sits in the hospital, in the bed, and you're going to tell, okay, you come in and give medication. You're going to do the nursing process again. Hi, how are you? Well, you, the identifiers, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you say, how are you? How are you feeling today? So what is the main complaint? Are you taking your medication? So there is some problems in the last few days or the last few hours? No. Okay. Perfect. You take the vital signs. Keep in your head. Always think about. Uh, always think about laboratory tests. Always think about. Even though you don't need it at this moment, but think always about laboratory tests. And then you go to your physical exam. Physical exam to check what are uh, the heartbeat. Is there some murmurs? A respiratory edema. So in order to monitor how is the response of the patient. If the patient is responding very well, you don't have any sign, any symptom in the in these areas that I just mentioned. And then you're going to give the medication. After that medication you is given, you wait until uh, half an hour, for, uh, 45 minutes, in order to ac actually check again your vital signs to see if the medication is responding or not. Okay? Now, if the heart rate is less than 60, Beats per minute, you need to stop. Okay, how do you check? How do you check the heartbeat? You're going to check with the apical pulse. You know what is apical pulse? Yes. Okay, for apical pulse, what you need to do is to put the stethoscope on the on the heart in the area, right, of the heart in the uh, fixed intercostal space with the mid clavicular line and make the patient to sit up. 
or make the patient to lay down a little uh, to, to the left side. Why is that? If you don't participate, look, for me, it looks like that. People doesn't have an interest. So I, I, I wish it could be, I mean, resident. residential, you don't have escape. I walk directly, I ask you. Is it because but, of the anatomy of the heart? Yeah, okay. So what you're doing is, what you're doing is when you're bending forward or lay down on the, on the left side, what you are doing, and that is the correct way to do ap apical pulse. Why? Because when you are doing that, the heart is going to get closer to the chest wall. And the chest wall is going, the heart is going to beat against the chest wall more energically. So you can count more clear, you can hear more clearly the sounds. That's why. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay, please, if you don't make dynamic the class, I'm telling you, the class is just not me. It's just, it's you too. If we don't finish the class, what I can say, what I'm trying to explain. So I want to know if you got it or not. So what time is it? All right, it's 12 o'clock. All right, so let's have a lunch break. And uh, I will, so please think about it, okay? When you come back, I want your participation. Just make noise, make whatever. But tell me you are there, please. Okay? So I will see you, I will see you at 1240. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.
Hello, hello. Hello. Hi, Dr. All right, so what I'm going to teach you is something that is very important. So please pay your attention. Don't lose even one second. All right, so let's just get started. Okay, so uh, okay, so the slides is helping me a little bit. Okay. Okay, so the beta blockers. So please, you must remember this propanolol. It's the Inderal second, but actually Inderal is the commercial name. But what you need to remember is the propanolol. Atenolol. Okay. So don't get confused with the albuterol. Albuterol is all only. OL. This is LOL. Albuterol is a beta 2 agonist. LOL is the propanolol, atenolol, timolol, osmoprolol, lol, 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 lol. Okay? Okay, so this is beta blocker, please pay attention, is going to increase the span of life. So what does it mean? Statistically, we know, and we don't know what exactly why, the beta blockers prolong the life of a person who has heart failure or actually a, a hypertension. The rest are going to control, the rest, the R, the A's, whatever, they're going to control the blood pressure, but statistically we see that there's these people who use basically this do not live longer time. The ones who make them longer live longer time are the beta blockers. Beta blockers. You okay with that? Okay. Yes. All right. So now here we have you already know that the beta blocker, please, beta blocker, beta beta blocker, I'm going to put beta blocker is chronotropic negative that is a question for exam inotropic negative so they are going to decrease the heart rate and decrease the contractility now if you have your blood your heart rate less than 60 because the normal rate is 60 to 100 is there is 60 or less uh, 59 sorry 59 or less they are going to basically you need to observe the medication Okay, so that is number one. Number two, never run out of supplies. Never run out of supplies. All right, so I will put it the other way. Always supplies. Always need to be supplies. Supply. So never you are running out of the medication. Why? Because in this beta blocker, when you stop the medication, they can have a rebound effect. So if you don't have, the body doesn't have the, the beta blocker, the, high, the blood pressure can actually go high all of the sudden. So never running out of supplies, all right? Never running out of supplies. Always you need to have the supplies. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, this is the part I want to go over. I will tell you this. Okay. Avoid patients with asthma. So for that, I need to go to the next slide and I need to show you something here. Listen to this. This is huge, please. This is the main for many pathologies, okay? The beta blocker are going to be no selective and selective agent. Beta blocker can be selective and no selective. What does it mean, no selective and selective? You already know that, for example, the, uh, I will start like this, the adrenaline, just to give you one example. Adrenaline is going to affect the alpha one and basically the, uh, the beta one. In, in third place, are going to affect the beta two. Okay? But this adrenaline, the alpha two, is going to be basically, you see, alpha one is a vasoconstriction but alpha-2 is a vasodilation, right? So, but this is, uh, depends. Why? Because first of all, the alpha-1 are going to be more, having more affinity, more affinity than the alpha-2 to adrenaline. 
So when you give adrenaline, alpha-1 is going to be activated far away earlier, much more earlier than the alpha-2. Okay? So that is one. Now, if I mention this adrenaline, for example, uh, we have adrenaline. Adrenaline is going to affect the alpha-1, the beta-1, and beta-2, and then the alpha-2. All right. So they are going to be, adrenaline is what we call, no, it's a no-selective. It's a no-selective. No-selective. So no-selective means that it's going to affect all the receptors of the, uh, all the alphas and all the betas. In certain manner, more or less, they're going to affect all of them. So that means there is no selectivity. So adrenaline is not just for alpha-1. It's not just for beta-1. It's not just for beta-2. Adrenaline is for all of them. That is called no selective. When you have selective, that means that only one or probably two of these of these receptors. All right. Based on that uh, 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 explanation, I'm going to talk about the beta blockers. Beta one blocker. Okay. The beta one blocker. What is going to block is going to be the beta one yes or no yes now excellent when you have a no selective no selective no selective beta blocker you're going to block beta one but they can block they can block beta two you okay with that yeah yeah okay so Beta 1 is the no select. So if you give propanolol, lol, 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 propan, propranolol, propranolol, are going to be a beta 1 blocker, they are going to block the beta 1. What it's doing is going to decrease the heart rate, chronotropic negative, and it's going to uh, uh, decrease the contractility, are going, to the, are going to be inotropic negative. But at the same time, because this is no selective drug, they can block the beta-2. And what is beta-2 doing? Beta-2 doing bronchodilation. But if you have, because of no selectivity here, that beta-1 blocker can block the beta-2. And the beta-2, in this case, are going to produce the bronchoconstriction. And that is where, why it's contraindicated to give a patient with asthma. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. Now, we have another beta-1 blocker that is selective. This selective, you must remember this name, is the atinolol. Atinolol. That is a beta-1 selective. So... If you have asthma, you don't. If you need to give a beta beta one blocker, you're going to give beta one blocker selective the atinolol. Atinolol, is that clear or not? Yes. 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 Okay. So now I'm going to teach you something that is next next level. I will say next next level. All right. So beta one. Beta one. Are beta 1, I say agonist beta 1, are going to stimulate or increase the levels of the renin. And beta 2, and beta 2, beta 2, what is going to produce is the increase of the insulin. Don't forget that. All right. So beta-1 produce increase of the renin. So I already told you the beta-1 produce increase the heart rate, are going to increase the contractility, the contractility, and it's going to increase the blood pressure because they are going to increase the cardiac output because beta-1 increase the renin too. Beta-1 increase the renin. The beta-2 Beta-2, when you have the albuterol, albuterol, that is a beta-2 agonist, so you, you said, you know that. 
I put beta two, it's the same to say beta two agonics. I put beta one, it's like beta one agonics. So I don't need to put agonics because it's beta one, beta two, okay? So beta two is going to stimulate the insulin. And if that is going to produce insulin, beta two, they can produce actually more increase of insulin, more glucose get into the cell, they can lead into hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. I got one big screen. Uh, hypoglycemia. Okay, so now, how to remember this? Very simple. Now, you get it. Look at that. I want you to remember betas. Okay, try to memorize that right now. Close your eyes. Beta, beta one, beta two, beta one, beta two, beta one, beta two. Set beta one, Reni, increase the Reni. Beta one, increase the Reni. Beta one, increase the Reni. Beta two, increase the insulin. Beta two, increase the insulin. So, which substance I need to remember? Reni and insulin. Reni belongs to beta one, insulin belongs to beta two. How to remember that? Listen, how to remember that? Beta one, beta one, one in. Beta two, two ins. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. So beta one is going to produce the increase of the renin of the insulin. Nice, right? The renin, right? Beta two. So you need to look for the word that has two in, 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 su, lin, in, in, two, in, in. Beta one. One in re nin in. We got it. Yes. yes. Okay. That is going to lead us into the side effect of the propanolol. Uh, now listen to this. Now I have beta. I'm going to put it in. Uh, I will say purple just to make it beta one. I'm not, I don't know if that's nice. No, it's not nice. No. I'm going to put it in blue. Okay. Beta 1, let's make it now beta 1 blocker. Aha. Beta 1 blocker. So what is doing the beta 1 blocker? In this case, it's going to decrease the rating. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. The beta, excellent. If the beta 1 blocker, if we are using the propanolol, the propranolol, the propranolol, that is a beta-1 blocker, but is not selective. Remember that propanolol is not selective. If there is no selective, the beta-1 blocker is going to affect the beta-2. So the beta-2 are going to, basically, because it's not selective, it's going to block to the beta-2, yes or no? Yes. 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 And that is going to lead into bronchoconstriction. Yes or no? Yes. And that is going to decrease the insulin. So you're going to have, if you decrease the insulin, there is no glucose getting into the cell. If that is the case, you have hyperglycemia. And that is the side effect of the propanolol or no selective beta blockers. You like it? No, you don't like it? Yes. We do like it, Dr. G. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. You better say that. You better say that. Okay, because this is not in the books. This is actually created by me. So it's a, a shortcut, a pathway. And don't share with anybody, just you. Okay, so if somebody said, okay, how do you know, Reni? Don't tell that one in, one in. No, it's just beta one blocker. How do you know beta two produce hyperglycemia? Well, it's just beta two blocker. It's just beta two blocker. Okay, all right, so simple as that. This, you need to review it like three, four, five, ten times until it's, staring, it's, staring, it's going to stick in your, in your, in your, in your mind. <laughs> I was going to say something different. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we have beta 2. 
All right. So here we have beta one. All right. So I'm going to focus in propanolol here. Look at this. Look at this, what I'm going to say. Eh? Propanolol. Please, this is so important. Propanolol. Propanolol. Before propanolol, I need to tell you, and please, the link is here. So I'm not talking, talking because of what I'm crazy. No, you will see that in the connection. You have hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. The signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, low levels of sugar in blood, are going to be number one, uh, what is sweat, uh, are going to be number one, tremors. Tremors. Tremors means shaky, shakiness, and sweat. This sweating is very much, uh, very intense, right? It's almost diaphoresis, a lot of sweat, a lot of... So you're shaky and sweat. That is when you have hypoglycemia, okay? So when you're going to see that, basically patients who are taking, who are diabetic patients, if they take too much insulin, too much injection, the glucose is getting into the cell, leading into hypoglycemia. And the signs and symptoms are going to be tremors and sweat. If you have, if you take medication, PO medication of poor diabetes, you're going to have too much medication. You actually, what, what is diabetes? Too much glucose in blood. So the medication is to do what? To decrease the glucose in blood. But if you take too much insulin or too much oral hypoglycemic medication, your glucose are going to go too low. And that is going to leave you, give you into shakiness and actually sweat you must know that when you are doing diabetes and that is telling you that the patient needs some sugar otherwise the patient is going to be hypoglycemic look at yourself when you are hypoglycemic you want to sleep you want to lay down you don't want to do anything this hypoglycemia is very severe the patient can actually even enter into coma all right so that is hypoglycemia tremors 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 okay so now, the treatment for for other uh, for for tremors, all right? For tremors, tremors, tremors or tremors, tremors are actually going to be no well, well. Actually, we use propanolol as a treatment for tremors. Some people are having essential tremors. They don't. They are not diabetic, but they are having some shakiness of their hands, and they are going to treat it with propanolol. So tremors are going to be treated with propanolol. Tremors, tremors. And these tremors are going to stop. Correct. Perfect. But in addition to that, propanolol, what is going to produce is hyperglycemia, as I mentioned here. And that is high yield for NCLEX and GESI. So propanolol, what you need to remember, is going to hide, hide, signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. But, but, and the other thing is they can cause hyperglycemia. All right, so if you have a patient taking propanolol and at the same time they're having diabetes mellitus, so if the patient is hypoglycemic because they was taking too much medication of uh, insulin or hypoglycemic, they are going to have tremors, but these tremors are going to be hided. So you cannot recognize the patient is having hypoglycemia because the patient is taking propanolol, are hiding the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Okay? In another situation, in another moment, not at the same time because you cannot have hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia at the same time. You cannot, right? So, but when you are in hypoglycemia, if you are a diabetic patient, the, if you are taking propanolol, propanolol, this propanolol are going to hide the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. You cannot tell when the patient is having hypoglycemia. Now, the hypoglycemia is not a problem enough. 
So, but the patient, the patient is taking just a, 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 a propanolol, just a, a, a no selective, a no selective uh, beta blocker, and that itself can produce signs and symptoms of uh, hyperglycemia. W what are the signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia? P, P, and P, P polyuria. You pee a lot. Polyphagia. You eat a lot. And polydipsy. You drink a lot. You pee, you eat, you drink a lot. So that are the signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia. No, I don't know. Is that okay? Are you get it or not, please? Yes. All right. So in conclusion, propanolol side effects can de can hide the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. In other situations, the propanol can produce hyperglycemia. Okay? That is typically from Enkles and Hesse. Another thing you need to remember about propanolol, very simple. Inotropic negative, chronotropic negative. I'm, I'm telling you, this is coming. I'm telling you, this is coming. So please, okay? All right. All right, so let's keep moving. All right, so side effects. Avoid patients with asthma and beta blockers, especially the non-selective. The non-selective beta-1 blocker or beta-1 blocker is because it's not selective is going to block partially the beta-2. And what is doing the beta-2? The beta-2 produces the bronchoconstriction. So that is basically contraindicated with patients with asthma, with asthma, with asthma. Other, may, other things that you need to remember about patients with diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus, the beta-1, or, or said beta-1 agonists, beta-1 are, uh, a, uh, sorry, beta-1, uh, beta sorry, beta-1 blocker, beta-1 blocker can block the beta-2. So that's why cannot be given in asthma. But at the same time, the beta-2 Two alone agonist can increase the insulin, but if you block the beta two agonist with beta one blocker, you are going to decrease the insulin. Decreasing the insulin, you have more glucose into your blood, leading into hyperglycemia. So, you want me to go over again? because this is very important. Oh, you got it, you want your time to review it and memorize. Hello. Oh. You're good, Dr. G. We're fine. Yeah, we're okay, thank you. Okay. Now, another thing, the beta, beta blockers are not effective in African-American population, are not as effective as in other races. So now you already know very well. Remember the A, B, C, and D? Okay. The A's and the B's are not useful or effective in African-American population. Question for Enkles and Hesse. The A's and B's, so the A's inhibitors, the ARBs and the, uh, and the beta blockers are not as effective in African-American population. What so what happened with the C and the D? Yes, C and D are effective in African-American population. Okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So now, we have hold the medication when the blood pressure, systolic pressure is less than 100 millimeters of mercury. That is a no, no, stop, stop, stop. Or when your heart rate is less than 60. So when your blood pressure is less than, why? Because this is an antihypertensive, correct? So less than 100 are going to be hold the medication. Less than 60 hold the medication. Why less than 60? Because the beta-1 blockers are chronotropic negative. Chronotropic negative. This, the, the, all these concepts is this. You know, everything... 
or you don't know anything. That is about this antihypertensive medication. You want everything or you got nothing. It's everything or everything. Okay? So you must nail it that in your mind. Another thing that we are going to give you uh, another clue here, another tip here, NSAIDs. So NSAIDs are not going to be good to give to ACE inhibitors because they are going to decrease the effectiveness of the ACE inhibitors. Same for the ARBs and same for the beta blockers. So the A and B, ACE, ACE ARBs and beta blockers are going to be no effective for African-American, no give actually NSAIDs because that decreases the effectiveness of the drug. All right? Yes. Here yes. we have the beta blockers that are not selective and the selective. The selective means that it's going to be specifically for beta 1. It's going to block beta 1. It's not going to block beta 2 because it's selective for what? For beta 1. And the one I want you to remember is these two. The, uh, the atinolol and the metoprolol. Metoprolol. And that is the selective. The no selective are going, the one I want you to remember is the propranolol. Why I'm saying that? Because I like this? No, because I saw that in NCLEX, I guess. It. So I'm not trying to make you memorize all the names. I want just to one or two names plus the suffix. That is more than enough. I don't want to give you a lot or to memorize. I'll try to do the minimum. All right, so that is what I was explaining. Bradycardia, decreased blood pressure, bronchoconstriction, blood sugar masking, hypoglycemia signs and symptoms. There you are. So that can actually produce cause hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia. It's a two different, two different moments, two different times. All right, so two different moments. So you, you cannot have hypo and hyper at the same time. That is no sense. So what I want to tell you is they are going to hide, hide the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. I'm not, I, I'm not telling you that beta blockers cause hypoglycemia. What is, I'm telling you is the beta-1 blocker is going to mask the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. That is different. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. On the other hand, beta-1 blockers can cause hyperglycemia. How they can cause hyperglycemia? Because beta-1 blocker is going to block the beta-2. The beta-2 beta two alone is doing increase the insulin. Insulin. But if you have beta-1 beta blocker, no selective, like the propanolol, they are going to block beta-2. They are going to decrease the insulin. If you have low levels of insulin, nobody can make the glucose get into the cell. So you have hyperglycemia. That can cause hyperglycemia. When we are talking about hypoglycemia, beta blocker doesn't is not going to cause the hypoglycemia. What is going to do the beta one blocker is to mask, to hide, to hide the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Okay, all right. Now we have here uh, the uh, we have hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, what I want you to remember is the A's and the R's. A's and R's. A's and R's. So here we have decreased effectiveness is A's, R's, 2, and beta 1 block. Okay, so you cannot use with this medication NSAIDs because they are going to decrease the effectiveness of these drugs. Okay. All right, so let's talk about calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers is effective in African-American population. So A and B is no African-American population, unless you're being associated with another medication. All right, so we have calcium channel blockers, and uh, we have the uh, pine, 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 calcium channel blockers is the nifedipine, the nifedipine. We have amlop, am, amlopidine, we have felodipine, Diltiazine is out of the rule, verapamil out of the rule, but the most common nowadays is that, in NCLEX, is that nifedipine. Five years ago, the 
Amlodipi, Norvask. This Verapamil, Verapamil is used for migraines, other stuff. But basically, we use these two medications. Nifedipine, Nifedipine or PIN? Nifedipine and Amlodipine. So PIN, PIN, PIN or PINE, PINE, PINE. That is actually calcium channel blockers. Now you can understand how is that happening. If you have a channel, calcium channel blockers, what is going to decrease is that is going to block the constriction, the contraction, the contraction of the arteries, promoting vasodilation, because the smooth muscle of the tunica media is not contracting. It's basically promote that vasodilation, the relaxation. Okay. In addition to that, in the heart, the calcium channel blocker, the heart muscle, they need to enter calcium in order to contract, right? And these calcium channel blockers are going to be used for arrhythmias. They can be used for instead to have loop, 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 uh, instead to have loop, 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 loop. If you have loop, 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 loop like this, they're going to do calcium channel blockers. They're going to produce relaxation of the of the of the smooth muscle of the tunica media of the arteries, decreasing the blood pressure because decrease the peripheral resistance. And in the case of the heart. We are going to use in heart failure. You don't want to make the heart failing work harder. So they are going to contract less stronger. And what we are going to use is calcium channel. All right, calcium channel, cal cal calcium channel. So pro are going to decrease the decrease the contraction. But this is not only the heart, the vessel. They can produce the diminish of the contractility of the peristalsis making the stools stay longer time in your in your colon and what is the function of the colon absorb water the longer time the stools stay in the colon the less water the the the, the poo poo is going to have so it make it harder promote the constipation calcium channel blocker c a calcium c o constipation c c calcium calcium constipation Calcium, constipation. Talking about diuretics, in diuretics we have the hydrochlorothiazide and the chlorothiazide. Thiazide, 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 thiazide is everything that we already uh, talk in uh, when we talk about diuretics. Remember diuretics? Look diuretics, potassium sparing. We have uh, thiazide, we have osmotic, and we have the uh, carbonic anhydrase in inhibitor, five of them. All right, so this thiazide is the first line of treatment for hypertension. When you have a stage one, you give only one drug. The most common is going to be the thiazide. When you have a stage two, they are going to use two drugs. They are going to use other combinations, but a common combination is to give a, a drug associated or with the thiazide. Two drugs. The stage two, two drugs. A stage two, two drugs. A stage one, one drug. Okay? All right. So let's go to other effects here, please. Uh -huh. There you are. We have another medication that is the renin inhibitor. Now you understand Renin inhibitor. Renin inhibitor is going to block all the cascade of to produce aldosterone. So there is no retention of sodium, no cardiac output increase, the blood pressure goes down. The name is the as aliskerin. Ren, ren, aliskerin, aliskerin, aliskerin. Coming from the word renin. So what is doing? is actually going to block the renin. This as well is not effective to African-American population. Okay, African-American population. These are more kind of uh, not that common. What, when I said that, I'm telling you that there is other drugs that are more common. So those drugs is the one who you need to nail it in your mind. This renin, there is few questions, or probably sometimes they are not asking any about this, 
but you must know this. Renin reserve patients that do not respond to ACE or ARDS. That is the Renin. The Renin or at least carry. Okay? All right? We okay with that? Yes. Okay, so thank you. We have the aldosterone receptor antagonist. Re listen to the name, aldosterone. The aldosterone is coming from the adrenal gland. So the adrenal gland is already released from the adrenal, the aldosterone is released already from the adrenal gland. So, but what is happening is that the aldosterone will not be able to find the receptors in the kidney. So they are going to block, the aldosterone receptor antagonist is going to block those receptors. So the aldosterone exists, but do not find the receptors. So the aldosterone is not going to be effective. And what is the name? Is the epleronone. 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 We are going to do a few things on it. All right, so we have direct vasodilators. We have the hydralazine. All right, hydralazine. Hydralazine is a very important medication when other medications are not going to be useful. And hydralazine is mostly used in cases of emergency. It's very good medication. They're going to produce a, a very low, uh, lower the blood pressure very much. And that is basically reserved for a stage two hypertension. Okay? A stage two hypertension. Please, in medicine is an art. When a patient is having treatment for hypertension, basically each doctor, each cardiologist are going to have a trials of how you, let's see, it's very common to say, let's see, I'm going to give you the medication and let's see how you respond to that. I'm going to check up you in two weeks. Right? Because and each patient responds different to the different medications. So there's patients with hypertension that are, are actually having different regimens of medication. So sometimes they have one only or two or three, even four of this medication for hypertension to try to control the hypertension. Hydralazine is a potent vasodilator. Okay? Of course, what it's doing is that decrease the peripheral resistance. So look at this, we have, this is the ARA. In the previous one, this is ARA, ARA, ARA. So we have ACE inhibitors. We have, uh, what, ARBs, ARBs, and we have, this is ARA, ARA. Aldosterone receptor antagonist, okay? All right. This is a receptor blocker, ARBs. And this is a tyrosine convertized enzyme blocker. So he has to block the enzyme, he is going to block the receptor, he has another receptor going to block. Okay. Let's talk about the alpha 2. The alpha 2. Alpha-2 is, what is doing alpha-2? I say, I say alpha-2 agonist, agonist. So, because we are want to treat the blood pressure, high blood pressure. How we, we treat our blood pressure? In, uh, increasing, increase or decreasing the peripheral resistance. How we can decrease the peripheral resistance? With vasodilation. Alpha-2. Alpha-1 is one highway road. And Alpha-2 are going to have two highway road. Alpha 2 more wider because two lanes and alpha 1 more narrow one lane. To try to memorize the alpha 1 is the basal constriction and the alpha 2 is two lanes highway basal dilation more wider. And then we have the alpha 2. We have the uh, clonidine. Clonidine is called a central effect. So this can produce a rebound effect. Rebound effect. So you need to be careful when you are administering the patient, especially in the first time. Patient in the first time. So we have the clonidine, the methyl dopa, aldomet, do, aldomet, dopamet, they're not a good. 
Catapres and Aldomed. Catapres and Aldomed. So those are alpha-2. Basically, these are being used in obstetrics, mostly when you have preeclampsia, when you have uh, uh, gestational uh, hypertension. All right, so, but you need to remember alpha-2 is the clonidine or catapres. It's the most common. Methyl dopa is used to in NCLEX, uh, but mostly when they are talking about maternity. Oh my God, I'm starting. What time is it, please? 122. Oh my. I think we are not going to finish, but when we have. But we are going to, I'm going to make some adaptation. Okay. Shock. Let me see how many shocks we have. Yeah. Do you talk shock? Uh, please help me. Do you talk shock in, uh, in your masters already? No. Okay. You're behind in, 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 in med search? Please, please tell me. Oh my God. I don't think so, but. Okay. So what happened with the rest? Why we are not talking? Tell me what happened. I, I'm, I'm doing wrong. I'm doing bad. Or what? You don't like the class? What? I mean, it may, making making me nervous. Please, why are you just watching, hiding on the screen? Next time I'm going to make everybody go to class. So and now nobody's going to escape from there. Nobody can escape. But please, I'm asking you your collaboration. What are you doing, Alejandra? Where where are you? Okay. I'm Dr. G. I'm in class. Why? I have my remediation. Oh, you finish? No, I'm barely going to take it. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so let's keep going. All right. All right. Good luck, dear. Good luck. All right. So let's talk about shock. Okay, so please, when you're talking about shock, oh, I'm in shock. That is not the shock we are talking about. What is shock? Shock in the colloquially means, oh, you surprised me. Oh, that is shock. But that is not the shock we are talking here. Okay? So the shock we are going to talk is this. Uh, shock. Shock is actually low blood flow to the cell of the organs. That is shock. So please, that is low blood flow to the cells of organs. That means perfusion. Okay, perfusion is, perfusion is blood flow to the cells. All right, so please pay attention to this. Per percussion, my God. Perfusion. Perfusion. Oh, so what, what, perfusion, what is perfusion? Everybody, blood flow to the cells. Everybody, what is perfusion? Blood flow, blood to, flow, the flow to the cells. Blood flow to the cells. So when you, what is low perfusion? Low perfusion is going to be low blood to the to the cells, low blood flow to the cells. And that is the concept of shock. What is shock? Low perfusion. You got it? Yes. 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 Okay. All right, so let's keep moving. Let me see what we have. All right, so we have three components of shock. So what can cause, uh, okay, so you know what? I, I uh, I will try to do my best, but definitely if you shock, you for my colleague, you need to know. All right, so shock means low perfusion. Low perfusion. And what can cause low perfusion? What can cause that the, the red blood, the oxygen blood, cannot reach Everyone is the heart. The heart. 
the heart, I will say here, let me see, uh, okay, the heart. We have the heart. The heart is not pumping. The heart had myocardial infarction, MI. They have a myocardial infarction, so the heart is not pumping anymore. It's like you have a pump of water and you throw it against the floor and you want to make it work again. So the poor pump is going to, is going to try to do it, but it cannot. So the same thing is happening. So the heart cannot pump all the blood. So there is low perfusion. That is going to lead you into shock. Okay. Another one are going to be the vessels. The vessels. And I, let me check here. Okay, the vessels. The vessels uh, actually will be, uh, for example, are going to be vasodilate in extreme, vasodilation. So listen to this, please pay attention to this. You have a river here, a river. All right, so I'm going to put a river here, a river. This is a river. The blood, the, the water is running this way. And I have, let's put it, a, I will say, a hundred, 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 uh, hundred gallons per second here. Hundred gallons per second are happening. Uh, so let's put 25 gallons per, 25 gallons. It's like the, the, the gas that you put in your, your SUV, your tank is about 25 gallons. And they need to pass through this vessel. So this is having some velocity, velocity one. But what happens if I have this vessel like this now, but I have still only 24 gallons. How is the velocity? Low of or faster? Oh. Fast. Ah? Slow. A slow. It's going to be a slower. And that actually can lead into low perfusion. And that can lead into shock. Okay? All right. So I'm trying to summarize very fast because it's a lot. And number three, blood. You don't have enough blood. So that all, those are the three components that you have shock. Okay, shock. So what you need to do is to increase the, the perfusion in shock. All right, so let's keep going. The classification of shock. Look at this. Classification of shock. The classification of shock are going to be this. Hypovolemic shock. Look at this. What are the three components of shock? What are the three components of shock? Tell me, what are the three components of shock? Heart, vessels, blood. Heart, vessels, and blood. Correct? Excellent. Yes. Hypovolemic. That means low blood. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So, so that means blood is the problem here. Or no? Yes. The cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock. Who is, the, who is the problem? Heart. Heart. The heart. There you are. And the heart will be MIs, for example, right? MIs. MIs, you are limping. You have MI in your thigh, your muscles of your leg. Some muscles are dead. Can you walk? You No, you cannot. The same happened with the heart. The heart, some muscles are dead. The heart is not pumping anymore, as, as before. We have, actually, the the vessels distributive. Why? Because here we have the septic shock, septic shock, anaphylactic shock is when you have peanuts or you are uh, allergic to iodine or you are have a uh, uh, anaphylactic reaction with uh, medications or you have a cross, uh, uh, I mean, you have a serotype blood A, and they give you B, for example. And that is going to produce hemolysis, right? And neurogenic shock, I'm going to explain you now. Anaphylactic shock are going to be because of the vasodilation. 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 Anaphylactic shock. What is doing this? The most common. You have allergic to the bees and to the wasp and ants. They can, you can have anaphylactic reaction. Your normal vessel is like this. 
but with anaphylaxis, your vessels become like that. So as you said in the previous, the blood flow is going to be low. So there's going to be low perfusion, low perfusion. So anaphylactic reaction, septic reaction, septic shock, septic shock. What happened? The, the, the bacteria are going to produce toxins. These toxins in the wall of the vessel are going to produce the vasodilation. And that produces low perfusion. And that is going to lead into shock, septic shock. Septic shock, when you have too much bacteria in your, in your, in your blood, you have an infection that is not being under control. And the neurogenic shock, the neurogenic shock is when you have the spinal cord that is coming, the spinal nerves go to the urinary bladder, for example, urinary bladder, you have a car accident and you cut all this. There is no control of the urinary bladder. So actually what happened, this produced a vasodilation of the vessels and make the urinary bladder to not able to contract. So that is going to be called neurogenic shock. So, so distributive shock is blood vessels, uh, uh, vessels. Okay. All right, so now, uh, all right, so this uh, obstructive is when you have a clot, a clot in the heart traveling in the blood. So the clot is going to be the heart, vessels, and, and what, and blood. Because the clot is forming form in the blood, can be localized inside the heart, or it can be a, basically a, 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 the heart, the vessels, and the blood. So the blood is a clot that is going to obstruct all the cavities. If we have a big clot in the atrium, so they are going to block the passage into the ventricle. Or you can have a big clot in the ventricle. So that is obstructed, clots, basically clots. All right, so for this and this class, we are going to use about vasopressors. Vasopressors, what is a vasopressor? Don't be surprised on that. The vasopressor is actually increasing the blood pressure, increasing the blood pressure. Increasing the blood pressure to increase perfusion. All right, so vasopressors. Now. The vasopressors are going to be used for, for all of this in the late stages. But what I want you to remember, and what you're doing with Mr. Verda, to lecture about shock, the vasopressors are going to be used from the very beginning in these three, septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and neurogenic shock. I want you to remember, especially these two, septic and anaphylactic. Remember, uh, these are going to be distributive septic or anaphylactic shock. Septic, when you have an infection, sepsis, septicemia. Anaphylactic, you're reacting against a medication or a drug, whatever. So just remember, anaphylactic shock and septic shock. Shock, shock, vasodilation. Okay, septic shock and anaphylaxis. This hypovolemic, at the beginning, do not need uh, vasopressors. You need to do blood in this case. The cardiogenic, uh, the cardiogenic, you need to control the myocardial infarction. You don't need vasopressors. Obstructive, you don't need to use vasopressors. The only that uh, medication that you need to increase the blood pressure are going to be in the septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and the neurogenic shock. Don't forget that, please, okay? Septic shock anaphylactic shock, and the neurogenic shock, sun. Uh, okay, sun. Shock, sun, whatever. Okay? Yes. Yes. All right. So I'm going to go into MedCert. That is basically what they are going to, you're going to talk about, the, the breathing, the heart rate, the, the blood pressure, and all that. So when you have blood, the one more thing I want to tell you. Uh, when the, when the, okay, so Dr. Mr. Verda is going to talk about the, the, uh, the, the mean blood pressure. Mean blood pressure is one third of systolic plus two thirds of diastolic. I'm not going to go on that because I need to 
of time. We can create a, a time in order to explain that, if you want. I would love to talk about that more, uh, more uh, of course, pharmacology, but related to more research too, okay? At this moment, I'm going to bypass that because time. All right, so here we have anaphylactic shock. That is shock, anaphylactic shock, shock, right? Basodilation. You're going to use the adrenaline. Adrenaline, 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 adrenaline. So, so I just remember adrenaline. Now, look at this. What does it mean, this? Look at that. Uh, what is that? Injection of the minerals. I want to, this, this one. What does it mean, this, this syringe? Look at this. One over 10,000. What does it mean? All right, so that means ep epinephrine. Epinephrine, what it's doing is the vasoconstriction. If you have vasodilation, you're going to use epinephrine. Epinephrine, epinephrine, epinephrine. It's going to be the salvatory medication. So how we understand this? One over 10,000. Look at this. One over 10,000. Follow me. So what does it mean, 1 over 10,000? 1 over 10,000 means that you have 1 gram of adrenaline and you have 10,000 10, ml. How much is 10,000 ml? 10,000 ml is 10 liters. It's like 3, gall uh, three gallons. And what, how much uh, adrenaline you have? About 1 gram. So that means 1 over 10,000, 1 over 10,000, 1 over 10,000. That is 1 gram of adrenaline over 10,000 ml. Now, what happened? If I have 1 gram, 1 gram is the same to say 1,000 milligrams. And I still have the 10,000 ml. So how many zeros I have? 1, 2, 3 zeros. I eliminate one, two, three zeros. What I get at the end? One milligram over 10 ml. If you divide 10 by 10, it's one. If you divide one by 10, it's 10. So it's going to be 0 0.1 milligrams in milligrams in one per one ml. It's not the same as this. It is. Okay. So don't forget that that calculation is coming for the exam. What time is it, please? 139. 139. Okay. All right. So that is basically what I was teaching you is the anaphylactic shock. You already know what is the concept of shock. Uh, it's, I, I don't know how I did it, but yeah, in a very short period of time, I explained you about shock. Okay, don't forget that, please, okay? Let's talk about the anti-anginal drugs, anti-angina. What is anti-angina? Angina is chest pain. Chest pain. When you have chest pain, why is the chest pain? So please, this is so important. So you have, you need to know what is ischemia. What is ischemia? What is ischemia? So please, what is ischemia? I don't know. Okay. Low oxygen. Exactly. Very good. Low oxygen. Thank you. Both of you. Low oxygen. Ischemia. Ischemia. Low oxygen. All right. So I want you to do imaginary homework because I'm not going to ask you to do that, but imagine your homework. So put your finger like this and put a rubber band. Rubber band. A rubber band. So don't forget, don't miss this. Rubber band. This rubber band are going to block the arteries that is bringing blood to the finger. Yes or no? So yes. that, that finger is not going to receive enough oxygen. So that finger starts to get into ischemia. Ischemia, you can have ischemia of the kidney, ischemia of the lungs, ischemia of the heart, ischemia of the liver, ischemia of the muscles. Ischemia, ischemia, ischemia means low oxygen. 
low oxygen to the organ. Okay, so, but in addition to that, you remember that the, the finger, like other, any other structure, they're going to have terminal nerves, terminal nerves, terminal nerves that are going to transmit pain, for example. This, when you, you put a rubber band around your finger, you, your finger become cold, blue, and then you start to have pain. You start to have pain. And that pain is caused because the blood is not reaching the nerves. The nerves are actually the receptor for the pain. And they are going to be decay and destroy. And that starts to have actually a pain. That is ischemia. And that pain is called ischemic pain. Ischemic pain. Do you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Now, the same thing is happening with the heart. The heart you have the coronary arteries that are going to basically be, when they are blocked, 70 to 80% blockage, you start to have this ischemia to the heart because the coronary arteries are going to divide in many branches, giving blood supply to the muscle of the heart, the myocardium. Now, is this, is the coronary arteries, one of these is blocked, all right? So when you're doing exercises, you need more oxygen because your heart is beating faster. So more demands of oxygen, but because of this blockage, the, the coronary artery cannot deliver enough oxygen. And what happened? The oxygen is going to be low in the myocardium. And the nerves that are located there are start to suffer and start to decay. And that is going to be similar to what happens when you put the rubber band in your finger. You start to have pain. That pain is called an ischemic pain. Ischemic pain. Ischemic pain. Ischemic pain, ischemic pain, ischemic pain, and it's called angina, 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 angina. So what is angina? Is an ischemic pain of the myocardium. See, you can talk now. Ischemic pain of the myocardium. What is angina? Is an ischemic pain. Ischemic. Don't say ischemia only. Ischemic pain is the right way to say. Ischemic pain. Ischemic pain. Is the chest pain. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Now, yeah. If you have ischemia because you have low oxygen, but is that is going to persist with the time? So if you have here, for example, totally blockage, you don't, if you don't block the, 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 I would say the tourniquet that you put there or the rubber band, your finger is going to die. Goodbye, die. Uh, finger. For, for how long? 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. So if you have tight 50 minutes, that finger is gone forever. Forever. If you have a cast in your, in your lower extremity, it's too tight, that is going to produce uh, actually a, a blockage of the vessels, ischemia, pain, a lot of pain. And what is going to end into ischemia is going to end into infarction. What is infarction? Infarction means dead tissue. Okay, we got it? Yes. Yes. Now, infarction is the same to say necrosis. Necrosis means dead tissue too. When we found the word necrosis, when you have these burns, for example, that, that third degree are burnt tissue, are necrotic tissue, correct? So when we are going to use necrotic tissue or infarction? Infarction is more clinical. Infarction is basically most, uh, most anatomical, more, more like histopato histo hist histology. Because necrosis, necrosis, you can make it evident with a microscope. That is necrosis. You don't say myocardiac necrosis. You don't say that, even though that we and I can understand what you're trying to tell me. You, I will see you a little bit weird because where was your school, right? Because everybody called myocardiac infarction. We don't call necrosis, even though the the same result is infarction and necrosis is the same. But we talk properly saying MI myocardiac infarction. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So this is the coronary arteries, and the coronary arteries are going to have 
uh, are going to talk about angina, angina pectoris, angina pectoris, or just angina, angina or angina pectoris. Pectoris means uh, chest, right? 55-year-old men present with recurrent chest pain that develop when the mow grass in his yard. He states that the pain in, involved the left portion of the of his chest pain and occasionally radi radiates to the medial portion of his upper arm. So there is a radiating pain. Remember, we was talking about the NOPQRST, right? So those are the uh, how to describe pain, right? So you can practice that. So basically, what happened in the heart? The heart you have pain on the left shoulder, sometimes in the right shoulder. So those are actually radiation of the pain, okay? You can have in your wrist, especially in the right wrist, or on the back, or you have like a, a stomach ache, like a gastritis. So those are basically radiation of the pain of the, of the heart. He says that the pain goes away after complete minutes, complete, couple minutes, and stop under unrest. And he also said that the pain has not increased in frequency or duration. Nitroglycerin is prescribed to relieve the pain. So what I'm going to do is this. So, uh, all right, so that is the PQRST. N-O, PQRST. So, yeah, I put the PQRST, but it's N-O, okay? All right, so what is the uh, number, The what is the occasion that caused the pain, what provoked the pain, what is the quality of the pain? The quality of the pain will be, for example, sharp, stabbing, as you read there, uh, dull. Uh, uh, radiation. Uh, radiation is going to be uh, for the pain, original pain is where it's going to go the pain. So you have pain here, but they're going to go somewhere else. In addition, radiation. Severity is one to 10 and timing when this happens, how long it's going to last. Okay, I'm not going to go on that. But what I want is just to tell you this. Okay, so angina. We have two types of angina. Angina that is, uh, let me see here, this one, a stable and or classic. So please, in the exam, you're going to be a stable or classic. All right, so I'm going to make an effort and I'm going to explain you a few things here. So can you give me 10 more minutes? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. How the patient is having a myocardial infarction? Why is everybody laughing? When, okay, you're smiling. Yeah, you're happy. Okay. So now, so when is, when is, do you know that somebody have a, a myocardial infarction? Oh, this patient was receiving a big surprise, a very bad news. Very bad news, and the patient died. Anna, can you text me too? Thank you. You're texting? Yeah, no? No, you're not texting? Oh, um, okay, my mistake. Sorry, I apologize, I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. Yes, sorry, sorry, and Miss, Miss Anna Arias. Uh, okay, extra point for her. In, in, it's in, okay. When we go into when you go into sleep, think about uh, extra point, like a dream, like a dream. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. So listen to this. I, somebody have a coronary artery disease, some blockage of the artery, some blockage of the. Listen to you. Use your imagination, please. The coronary have four millimeters diameter only, and it's blocked with cholesterol. Okay. Now. The, the, the signs and symptoms of angina are going to occur when you have a blockage of the one or more coronary art, uh, one of, of two coronary arteries, more than 70% obstruction. Okay, so look at this. What happened with a normal heart? Happened with a normal heart is this. You have systole, look at this. You have systole and diastole. Systole and diastole. The coronary arteries are going to arise from the from the from the aorta so the aorta is going to be compressed when you have a systole okay you know everybody is smiling i don't know everybody is focusing somewhere in this i will see your faces in the exam so 
All right. So I want your attention, please. Okay. So now, if this is... Um, a, all right. So what happened is this. When the systole is happening, the coronary arteries are going to decrease in diameter. Why? Because the heart is going to contract the, the, uh, the coronary arteries. Now, what does it mean? And remember this, the coronary arteries is the one who are going to distribute the blood and oxygen to the myocardium. Okay, perfect. So now, so that means that the coronary arteries are going to be full of blood during what time? During that diastole. When the heart is relaxing, that is where the majority of blood getting into the coronary arteries. Okay with that? Now, if you are upset, if you are doing exercises, your heartbeat is going to be faster, the heart is going to start beating faster. Now, between the time, normally, the time of the systole and the diastole, the, the heart normally, right now, you and me, we spend more time in diastole, diastole, diastole than systole. So that is wh wh why the heart, the, in diastole, we have filling up the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries are going to be filling up. Oh my God, don't make me faint. Okay, no, 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 don't, don't distract me. Okay, okay, what I'm saying? Okay, so you have in diastole, in diastole is where most of the blood came into the coronary arteries. Okay, perfect. Now, when you have exercising, what happened? You start to beat faster. And what happened? The time of diastole is less because the heart is more busy to try to beat faster. So it's sacrificing the time for diastole. So that means less blood going to the myocardium. Now, if you have a precondition, a pre-medical condition where the coronary arteries are obstructed and you're doing exercise or you are emotional or you get anger, the heart starts to beat faster because they need more oxygen, but it cannot be. Why? Because there is obstruction of the coronary arteries. And that is where it's going to trigger out the myocardial infarction. So if you have a precondition or atherosclerosis, a blockage of the coronary artery, and you do exercises, whatever ex or physical activity you're doing, you are going to just really actually cause a myocardial infarction in the middle of the process. Right? Mostly people, do you hear? Do you hear that? Yeah, uh, the the patient dying his bed, right? Do you hear that? It's because most likely they was doing sex, they was having uh, intercourse, and in the middle of intercourse, the heart start to beat faster with a precondition. That's it. Okay. All right. So all right. So in few words, I explain you that. Everybody's happy. I don't know why it's happy. I have something in my face or something. What? You're fine, Dr. G. It's, they're just all together in the remediation room. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is a question for the exam, please. Five minutes. We have chronic stable angina. That is the classical. I will see you next. Okay. Classical. The classical means stable stable means that when you're doing exercises activity you have pain but when you stop doing exercises you don't have pain anymore that is stable stable you okay with that stable the unstable means that you have angina angina but in any time doesn't matter if you are resting or in activity that is unstable angina. What is worse? The unstable angina. Is that clear or not? Yes. Yes. Variant angina is the Prince Metal. Sounds like a rock, right? Prince Metal uh, syndrome. Those are spasms. A, a, a spa, it's a, a temporary contraction of the coronary arteries without the presence of any blockage. 
So, but the two I'm going to ask you is a stable and a, and a unstable, okay? All right. All right, so let's talk about the laboratory tests. The, uh, the laboratory tests are going to be the CKMB. The creatine kinase uh, is actually, MB means uh, a variant of enzymes, it's a type of enzyme M, uh, M and B. We don't care about it, but creatine kinase enzyme. These creatine kinase enzymes are specific located in the heart muscles, in the heart cells, uh, muscle cells of the heart. So that's the creatine. So if you destroy by myocardial infarction, they enter into infarction, the cells are going to release everything what is inside, and they are going to produce the increase of creatine kinase. That is one uh, evidence of the, the patient having MI. Troponin. Troponin, oh, you know the troponin, giant cat, right? Or giant cat, the giant cat. Troponin, in this case, the, are going to be very much high elevated, all right? So this is going to be the troponin. Remember giant cat, right? Troponin, this is the troponin that is located to in the heart muscle. When this troponin is elevated, that means that it was the structure. <coughs> Sorry destruction of the myocardial muscles. And that is going to be another indicator that is actually telling you the patient is having myocardial infarction. Okay, so stable. Pain more severe in myocardial infarction. All right, so listen to this. Don't forget, you can save life here. If the pain lasts more than five minutes, that is most likely myocardial infarction. You need to go to the ER, 911. Okay? You save life already. All right, so what are the treatments for angina? Just remember the ABC RNs. ABC RNs. That is for treat actually angina. So, what is A? Is the ACE inhibitors. Even though the, you you can, they are going to use aspirin. If I use aspirin, I need to use beta blocker. Okay, so A's are going to be mostly A with A aspirin is going to be not a good mix because they are going to decrease the A. So if I give ACE inhibitors, are going to give beta. Uh, I can give beta uh, beta blockers. So conclusion. What is the treatment for angina? Forget about aspirin for a moment. A, B, C. A, ACE inhibitors. B, beta blocker. C, calcium channel blocker. You already know that. And RNs. You are RNs? Yes, you're going to be RNs. The Ranexa, the nitrate, and the statins. So that is what you need to remember for, for the exam. Ra um, what is Ranexa? Ranexa is going to basically uh, make the heart decrease the needs for oxygen. So they are not going to contract heart and the uh, Ranexa, what is going to do is to basically uh, uh, use fatty acids in the heart in order to obtain the ATP. So the needs of oxygen are going to decrease. So Ranexa, Ranexa looks like a name, Alexa, right? A Ranexa, this is Ranexa. Decrease oxygen needs of the needs of the heart. Nitrates. So please, nitrates is the nitroglycerin, is the sublingual, sublingual, a sublingual medication. This sublingual medication are going to be a potent vasodilator, are going to vasodilate arteries and vasodilate veins. So it's a very important potent. Potent, uh, potent what? Basodilator. Statin. Statin is the lipitor. Lipitor. You want to decrease cholesterol levels. Why? This is not for immediate effects. So it's just to prevent major damage later on. So you will, so the cause of this uh, blockage are going to be because of the presence of cholesterol. 
So that's why you must, and the patient must receive a static. So what is the mnemonic? You have A, B, C, R, Ns. Do you get with that? Yes. Yes. The last thing. You're going to, actually for emergency, for ER, for ER. The previous one is for maintenance, right? So the patient is stable. So for ER, you're going to use the MONA. MONA. What is MONA? M morphine. Why? Because the pain. Okay? Oxygen. Because your heart needs oxygen. Nitroglycerin is going to be uh, is going to be vasodilator to pre to increase the blood flow to the to the heart. And aspirin. Why we use aspirin here? Aspirin emergency because aspirin is going to decrease the clotting process, especially the platelet activation. Platelet activation. So when you have a myocardial infarction, you have one is you are one step behind that your blood, your heart stops. When your heart stops, the blood is not moving. When the blood is not moving, it's going to create clots. When you reestablish the movement of the heart, the clots are going to travel, whatever, and they are going to produce complications. A stroke or pulmonary embolism and you die. So when you are having aspirin and having this problem, you are trying to prevent more damage. So it's very important to give the aspirin in this case in that emergency. Do you okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. So, all right. So, let me see here. Okay. So, let's talk about the nitrates and we finish with that. All right. So, nitrates, what it's doing is, is listen, is the, uh, the nitroglycerin. The nitroglycerin. All right, so the nitroglycerin are going to be very, 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 very important, okay? So preload and we we'll talk about heart failure next time. But what is doing the nitrates are going to dilate arteries and, vein, uh, and veins, okay? So now, this can produce a tolerance. The nitrates can be given by sublingual or by patches, by patches. These patches are going to be given in the shoulder. So these patches, can, uh, this nitro can produce tolerance, 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 tolerance. So what you need to do is this. You need to remove the patch at night. You need to put the patch in the morning. So eight hours resting in between. So you put a patch in the morning. Why in the morning? Because this is the patient in more activity. The heart is pumping in different uh, rates because of they get excited or more calm, etc. But at night it's more stable, so it's going to rest. So that's why we take the patch at night. And we why we don't keep the patch at night? Why? Because they can produce tolerance. If you put too long time the medication, the medication will start to have tolerance. What that means tolerance? Tolerance means that you need more dose and more dose and more dose in order to have the same effect. And there is a moment that you have toxic levels and the medication is not working anymore. In order to prevent that, you need to actually remove the patches during the morning, during the morning. All right, so this, uh, please, this nitroglycerin need to be in dark environment, dark containers, dark containers, dark, dark. Why? Because the light is going to deactivate the nitrate. The light is going to deactivate the uh, darkness. You need to basically uh, always keep it with your, with your body, with you. Always the nitrous is going to be with a patient. And you need to uh, uh, check the medication and change it every six months because every six months expire. It's not going to be effective as before. All right? So they can produce actually headaches. Okay? Headaches. Very common. Now, don't give this patient who has... Who, who want to have intercourse, they use Viagra. Viagra. What is Viagra? Viagra was a medication that was discovered by chance. They was trying to experiment drugs that can produce the low, to decrease the low pressure, the pressure, to decrease the, the blood pressure. So and they, the, the trials, they find out that the people was very excited 
and they was asking for more. So they actually have what we have uh, an erection of the of the uh, of the penis, right? So why? Because the penis are in order to be erected, they need to have a vasodilation, and this vasodilation make blood fill up like a plastic bag. They're going to fill it up and make it hard. So that is what is doing the Viagra. So Viagra produce vasodilation. But if you have nitrates, that can produce a potent vasodilation. So if you mix and don't mix ever Viagra with nitroglycerin, because if you have potent vasodilation and the Viagra is a vasodilator, what you're going to do is going to have orthostatic hypotension. There is, so you're in the middle of the, of the round or the physical activity, whatever you want to call, and in the middle, there is no enough blood going to your brain. You are shut down, boom, and you die in this. You can get into coma and die. Okay, so never mix Viagra with nitrates. We okay with that? Yes. Okay, all right, so that is what you need to read. I don't Dr. Know. G? Yes. I have, I really have to go now. Give me one second. Who is that? Me, because I have to drive to- Who, who is me? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Erica, I, I'm, wait, I'm already late. Okay, go, go. I, I'm going thank to take you. just one more minute. So please, take note with your friends about this, okay? All right, thank you. I'll okay. watch the video again, thank okay. you. Sec, the last thing I'm going to talk about this is the uh, uh, this one. This is just one minute. All right, so listen to this. What am I going to say? Uh, see, yes. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so now look at this, please. You know a patient who has angina. You are, it's a friend, a family, whoever, right? Somebody has angina. So, okay, take your pill, the nitroglycerin. Put the pill under the tongue. Take one tablet under the tongue. And the signs and symptoms, they need to go away. Okay with that? Okay? So what to do? Nothing else. Okay? So look at this case number one. Case number one, I have angina. Oh, take my nitroglycerin. So, okay, ooh, okay, I feel better. That's all result? Okay, no. Perfect. That's okay. That is an a stable, a stable angina. But now I take the pill, I wait five minutes, five minutes, and the pain is gone. The pain, the pain is still. The pain is still. I, I even though I put my pill in my, under my mouth, under my tongue, my, my tongue, the pain is still after five minutes. So you need to give a second pill. A second. But at the moment you're going to give the second pill, you need to call the 911. Okay? If one is not enough, you call 911. Period. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Then yeah. the, the paramedics are going to are going to the paramedics are arriving and they give the third pill. You can give three pills. Not at the same time. One pill first, wait five minutes. And that is gone, the pain, you stop. Okay? The, the second, if the pain is persist and you uh, and you give the second pill, you need to call 911. If the pain persists, you can give a third pill. And if the pain persists after three, after that third pill, they need to change into IV. IV, nitro IV, oxygen, etc. Okay? All right, so that is briefly what I want just to mention. And in addition to that, heart failure, we are going to complete next class. Okay? Anna. Anna? Yes. Anna, are you there? I don't see I'm you. I'm right here. You can see me? Yeah, but you look, oh, oh, now I can see you. Thumbs up. Wait, Anna, Anna Arias? Or Anna, Anna Constantine. Now? Anna? Okay, okay. All right, so thank you so much. 
I going to cut the. I will see you uh, next Friday. And Thank, please, you. We, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.